Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> and it is Autism Awareness Month. So, with that being said, if you need anything purple, I brought extra purple mass. So that's just in case. And the month of the military child. Um, thank you for reminding me. Uh, we're going to have a proclamation tonight on that as well. Um, so again, a good morning. And we have um, a, a very full agenda, possibly getting more full by the moment, um, just to execute a few uh, orderly details here. The expectation is to have the um, the Schools of Hope and the IDEA presentation. Thank you and good morning, Dr. Graham, and good morning, Dr. Delange. So you'll introduce yourselves upon uh, upon the presentation. The expectation uh, will be about an hour full. With uh, inclusive is the Q and A. Uh, that could go into a little bit longer, but we'll see. So if that occurs, we will have time to spend perhaps one round of questions from uh, the booklet, the white booklet, which is uh, almost a ream of paper. Um, you may have a question on that. Uh, I know uh, I am reminded that the board meeting tonight, we will have speakers on that. Um, so we'll have one round of questions on that. Uh, and next we're going to get into a little a little bit of legislative talk, and I believe Member Snively wants to share a few suggestions. And then we have our new edition, the half hour exploration discussion on matters that, uh, that haven't been necessarily announced. So to be announced. Um, board members, I, I do know that uh, Member Perez, uh, I want to make sure that she's on the video, and she is. Okay, thank you, Mr. Porter. Um, also, we are now missing uh, Member Vaughn, but she's on her way. Um, and we want to recognize that Member Vaughn did put this request for the Schools of Hope and uh, the IDEA workshop, which is what we're having today. So we want her part of this, of course. Um, I will say, board members, we are going to perhaps have an emotional day with comments uh, during our board meeting. So we want to recognize that uh, that this is a time of the year where cuts, unit cuts, etc., adjustments are being made, uh, and therefore there will be public um, uh, comments. So, if we could get some of this out of the way here, that would be great. Uh, if not, we'll wait for the board meeting. But it, nonetheless, uh, our speakers tonight will include 33 speakers, uh, varying everything from unit cuts to mask wearing. Uh, and um, and fiscal um, matters. So, um, nonetheless, let's go ahead and get started. I first want to go ahead and uh, introduce, of course, our superintendent, who will introduce the subject area. Good morning, Superintendent Davis. Good morning, Chair. Thank you so very much, and we appreciate everyone for taking the time to, to learn more about our workshop for the Schools of Hope and overall the Hope op operators within the state of Florida and throughout the nation. So, overall objection will define what the School of Hope is and how the operator actually functions within uh, Hillsborough County in the state of Florida, and then transition to articulate the timeline for the district uh, required to be able to follow with the implementation of Hope within our school district, and discuss the roles and responsibilities of Hope. What does that look like, and what is the implementation plan? What is the overall vision and mission, and what do they do to 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 come to uh, the state of Florida to be able to to serve children, and at the same time being able to discuss the overarching expectations of our schools of hope and their operator and then talk about the, the the purpose and explain how schools of hope have chosen Hillsborough County Public Schools and uh, identify additional locations throughout the state and then finally take any questions and answers that may be um, proposed from the board uh, through our team and also we have uh, Dr. Graham here as well. So I'm going to transition to uh, Mr. Ayers uh, at this particular time that will discuss uh, overall platforms and what we'll cover within this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Um, board members, this, this presentation should take about 20, 25 minutes, and I wanted to take this opportunity to introduce the team who will be presenting. First, you all know uh, Chinsia 
Wang, who is our supervisor for our charter schools. And we're lucky this morning to be also joined by Dr. Dre Graham. Dre is the executive director of uh, Office in Independent Education and Parental Choice, who will be here, who have some slides uh, on the PowerPoint, as well as uh, to answer uh, any questions that you may have. And shortly, we will be uh, joined by uh, Mr. Adam Miller, who is the VP of Advancement uh, for IDEA Public Schools. And he'll be here once we get to the PowerPoint to take any questions you may have about our, uh, our HOPE operator um, for our district, um, IDEA Public Schools. So without be, uh, further being said, uh, Chinsia, go ahead. Okay. Good, good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Good morning, Chair Gray, um, board members, and Superintendent Davis. Uh, we'll start with a definition of a HOPE operator, and uh, this is an organization that is tax exempt, uh, that operates three or more charter schools in the state of Florida or in other states um, in, the, in the United States. And it is the DOE that places the designation of HOPE operator upon the organization. Their mission is to serve students who historically have lived in underserved areas and to prepare them for a successful life beyond K-12 grades. More of a vision, it's an approach that the DOE has taken and the DOE is committed to recruiting the most successful HOPE operators that have clear and successful experiences in underserved communities. Currently, there are five HOPE operators in the state of Florida, and they are Democracy Prep Public Schools, and although this HOPE operator carries the designation, it has not submitted any kind of notices of intent in, in, in any county. We have then IDEA Public Schools, uh, and I'll probably um, uh, mention IPS uh, to shorten, abbreviate uh, uh, the name, and, and it, it, it has uh, submitted uh, notices of intent uh, and uh, PBAs, uh, performance-based agreements in Hillsborough, Duval, and Polk counties. We have KIPP, New Jersey, that is in um, Miami-Dade County, Matter Academy in Lake, Miami-Dade counties, and they have applied in Orange County as well. We also have Somerset Academy, which is a little bit of an anomaly, and I'll explain that in the next slide, uh, that is in Jefferson County. So here we've got a little visual of what the enrollment looks like uh, in uh, um, um, the Schools of Hope. In, I've divided the IDEA um, public schools in Duval and Polk uh, with our IDEA in Hillsboro. And as you can see, um, Duval and Polk will have uh, a school each uh, in 2022, 2023. So um, our Hillsborough County will uh, open two schools in uh, next, this actually, this fall. Then we keep Miami-Dade. They already have three operating schools uh, currently. Uh, this year they opened, and uh, in a couple of years, in 22-23, we'll have uh, six. Matter Academy in Lake Miami-Dade and Orange um, eventually will have five altogether. Somerset in Jefferson is kind of a standalone because the county only has three schools um, in, on one campus. It's a very small county and it's a K-12 and the HOPE operator there was given the green light by the DOE to take over all the, the three schools, um, but they only have a thousand students. So that's a little bit of an anomaly. Um, so it, it, it operates differently, a little bit differently than the rest of the HOPE operators in other states, in other counties, sorry. All right, so we have defined what a HOPE operator is, and a HOPE operator operates uh, schools, obviously, and those schools are called schools of hope. So what is a school of hope? It is a school operated by a HOPE operator that must serve students from one or more persistently low performing schools, or uh, we call them PLPs, low performing schools. 
A school of hope must be in an attendance zone of a PLP or be located within a five mile radius of that school. And lastly, the majority of students enrolled in one of these schools must be on free reduced lunch. So they must uh, retain the designation of a Title I school. So how, do, how are these uh, Schools of Hope funded by the DOE? And they're funded uh, through a program called Schools of Hope Revolving Loan Program. And this loan will help with facility needs and startup costs of these schools. Um, the, the loan cannot be more than 25% of the project using a specific formula uh, based on student station and capacity of building. And uh, we don't have this current situation in, our, in Hillsborough County, but the School of Hope is not eligible for the loan if the district is allowing the use of one of our facilities. It is important to note that the funds of uh, this loan, um, the principal and interest must be repaid to the DOE so it can be made available to uh, future uh, schools of hope. So um, we follow with uh, a few maps and visuals so you can understand uh, where these schools of hope will be located in Hillsborough County or where they might be located in the future. Currently uh, you're looking at right now is um, a map of Hillsborough County with all our low performing um, uh, schools uh, and we've divided them kind of in uh, uh, areas of Hillsborough County so you can see how many East Tampa has, Plant City and East County combined, Temple Terrace, Tampa Heights has one, and the University of Area. And uh, what does enrollment look like um, currently um, moving forward based on the notices of intent and uh, performance-based agreements. We have three schools operated by IDEA Public Schools that um, um, will be opening in the future. Uh, two actually are opening up in August and that's uh, IDEA Hope and IDEA Victory. One is in um, located in on 10th Ave, East 10th Avenue uh, kind of off of uh, 50th Street and Idea Victory on Nebraska Avenue. And you can see the enrollment there and the grades that um, will, be, will be served um, starting the first year. So the model of Idea Public School is to open K through 2 and grade 6 the first year and then slowly, gradually go up a grade uh, each year until they're K-12. Uh, uh, so from the performance-based agreement, it looks like uh, by year six, uh, idea these two schools, Idea Hope and the Idea Victory, will have K-12 students. Uh, the third one that is uh, uh, scheduled to open in 2022, um, it, we just call it campus number three because we don't have um, we don't have not determined a location for it yet. So here's a visual of uh, where Idea Hope is located, uh, and you can see the low the the PLP schools, the persistently low performing schools uh, surrounding it. Um, so we, you see Kimball, Sheehy, James, uh, Oak Park, Sulphur Springs, Foster, and Palm Harbor. Idea Victory, located on uh, Nebraska, as you can see, will be you know serving students, potential students from Forest Hill, Suffer Springs, Foster, Kimball, Robles, Shehai, and James. So, what is the timeline for school districts to follow um, the, the the law, the rule? Um, dictated by the DOE uh, is uh, has a very strict timeline. So 
When this hap it, when uh, the hope operator uh, submits the notice of intent uh, to the district, uh, we have 60 days to review the notice of intent and uh, performance-based agreement, approve, and then execute the agreement. That means bringing it uh, to you, to the board, uh, to execute. And after that, we have 10 days to send the executed copy to both the DOE and hope operator. If the district does not meet the 60-day requirement, we must reduce the admin fee that we collect from all of our charter schools in our portfolio to 1% until the performance-based agreement is executed. So just to give you a, uh, some numbers, as of today, we've collected in administrative uh, fees uh, $2,909,000. Uh, dollars, and if we had to reduce that to 1%, it would come up to 624000 So quite a substantial difference. So um, after we execute the performance-based agreement, the district uh, by law must provide each school of hope with each student's uh, performance assessment and growth data by September 15th. That is in the law. Um, on October 15th of the first year, the district has 30 days to review the proposed year one academic goals submitted by the Schools of Hope, uh, basically to determine reasonable ambition of academic goals. On October 15th of the second year, then the School of Hope submits uh, the academic performance goals for year two through uh, year five. The Hope operator also has responsibilities uh, towards the district and they must provide the district with a facility lease agreement or ownership documents. Uh, they must provide the district of, uh, to the district a certificate of occupancy 15 days prior to the opening of the school. And of course, as mentioned in the previous slide, they will provide the district with their proposed academic goals by October 15th, the first year and the second year. And now I hand it over to um, Dr. Graham from the DOE. Good morning. Uh, Chair Gray, Vice Chair Han, board members, thank you so much Superintendent Davis for having me here today. Uh, always a great time whenever we get a chance to talk about what's best for students. I appreciate being on the agenda and having a chance to speak this time. Uh, we've talked about the what and we understand the, the, the purpose and how it looks in law and what's been established currently. But something that's so important for us to discuss when we're talking about a new manner of providing opportunities for our students is the why. And at the root of understanding this why for the schools of hope is an understanding of the term equity. Uh, you're all very educated individuals and I hate reading slides but I think it's really important for us to pay attention to this next quote that you'll see on on the slide from the thought leaders at Thinking Maps Learning Communities. And this is a really great uh, explanation of what true equity is. Equity in education requires putting systems in place to ensure that every child has an equal chance for success. I want to reiterate that putting systems in place. So it's the creation of additional systems that operate within the currently established system. It requires understanding the unique challenges and barriers faced by the individual students or by populations of students and providing additional supports to help them overcome those barriers. While this in itself may not ensure equal outcomes, we all should strive to ensure that every child has an equal opportunity for success. And that's what we're going to talk about here for the next few minutes is the opportunity. I always like to think of, of things whenever I'm, I'm looking at different situations and, and, and new ideas for, for students, how would I have handled this whenever I was over at the corner of 56 and Sly. In my four, and within my four walls, how was I being equitable as an educator? What was I doing for that student sitting in the back of my classroom to help them to achieve at the same level that, that they could achieve the best version of themselves? So with that, I, I want to provide a, a quick visual, and this will be 
be quick, so bear with me. We've, we've seen this picture, right? This depiction of, of, of equity and where you have, we're moving from equality to equity. So I've always looked at this as being a, a time continuum. So we start with equality with an intentional move to equity. But there's a fundamental issue with this picture. And it's used so often that it's important to, to understand why, in my opinion, there's a fallacy here. What we see is the person who's able to see over the fence and ignore the fact that there people have issues, oh, they're looking at a game. That's not what we're referring to. We're talking about them having the ability to see. Moving from equality to equity, you see that the box, the support that was there for the person who could already see over the box has been removed, has been given to the person who was unable to see over the fence, right? So often we view equity as the removing of supports from one, one demographic or one area of people or one, one group of students to facilitate the learning of another group of students. So now we move on to a more updated version of this in which now we're taking into account those students who may have different exceptionalities. And so now we're seeing, okay, well students with disabilities are now taken into account within this, within this, this display, but still we see that those aspects that were supporting the, the person, the, the taller person who could already see have once again been removed. I would suggest that this is the most accurate depiction of what true equity is. We're continuing to provide the supports that were already in place while providing another opportunity for us to enlist other resources to continue to provide the supports for those who couldn't. A really important of equity that we don't always discuss is the fact that it includes both spectrums of learning outcomes. It's not just the students who are underserved and the students who aren't achieving the, the levels of enrichment and, and um, academic achievement that we expect. It's also those students who need the enrichment portion, those students who need to continue to be, to be pushed. As an IB student, I, I, I understood that. It, it, was, it was a need for me to attend an international baccalaureate program that was, that was rigorous because at, that was the, the level at which I was able to, to accomplish. I wasn't pushed enough in a program that, that maybe wasn't as rigorous. And so we have to make sure that we're identifying both sides here. So with this specific area, when we're talking about Schools of Hope, obviously this is geared towards those students who are in those areas of generationally impoverished, just underserved communities. So we have to understand that the Schools of Hope are filling a gap. Uh, and when we look at the utopian view of, of, of um, equity, we're not having to reallocate finite resources. We're able to tap into an additional resource that helps us to facilitate the goal of attaining equity. And that's where we are with the Schools of Hope. We're introducing a new concept that hasn't been in existence, that hasn't been in existence before, that is specifically targeting an at-need demographic an area that needs the opportunity to become and to pursue that best version of themselves. We have to, when we, when we understand this, we have to also understand that this is not, this is not at a, a, a um, we're not detracting from the hard work that happens with the teachers and the administrators who have been in those schools working day in and day out. We have to also understand that there are only so many hats that those educators can wear. When we're looking at the site-based educators, they give their, their blood, sweat, and tears into those students, but they're battling so much more than just academic achievement. And so how can we use the resources that are provided within the context of our public education system in order to collaborate to offer these students who have generationally, we're not talking about just the ones who are here now, we're talking about the ones who have already gone through the system, we're talking about the ones who are coming through the system, how can we provide them with an opportunity to elevate not only themselves but their community and their families to achieve more? Here in Hillsborough County, we talk about preparing students for life, right? That's been our motto for, for so long. I would suggest that there's some words missing from that. We want to prepare students for a better life, not continue to perpetuate the cycles that have already generation, generationally had, had issues. So how are we going above and beyond and preparing those students for a better life and not continuing to establish and work within the systems that are already there? Equity, new systems. How are we putting new things in place? So with this, we have to understand that that is the genesis for the concept of Schools of Hope. It is a very targeted initiative to make sure that we are elevating all aspects 
of our students. And so not just continue to pour into those who will achieve regardless, but being targeted and being specific and being strategic and surgical with our approach to education. With this is a pathway of proven high, high quality public school operators to elevate these specific communities. So one of, the, one of the big aspects about Idea Public Schools is that they're sending 100% of their students to, to, to college, 100%. So, and this, and I think it's important to note that these are not, uh, these are these are different. All of the hope operators have been researched, have been, um, we have looked into, we've done national searches for the institutions that are educating at the highest of levels, in order to attain the status of being a hope operator for the state of Florida, and that is why they're given the opportunity to do what they say they can do. And so as we know, this is still a new concept here in, in our state. And so what we go by is what they have done throughout the rest of the nation. We have the ability here through their implementation to leverage resources. We talked about that earlier, having a, being able to draw from an additional pot of resources that doesn't currently exist, that we're not currently tapping into. And then our barometer for, of success in these situations is, are we better serving the students who come from these communities that have struggled for decades? Once again, it, at the bottom line, and my bottom line will always and forever be, what is best for students? Are we giving these students the opportunity to succeed? I'm a numbers guy, so just to share some few numbers before I, I close out my portion and we get to the Q&A. But why do we need this in Hillsborough County? As I'm sure you know, here in Hillsborough we have 39 schools that have been identified as persistently low performing schools in our state. That's the highest in the state of Florida. To give you some comparisons, uh, when we look at, we are the seventh largest county, seventh largest district in the nation. So when we look at those other districts who are in that top 10, we have Miami-Dade, Palm Beach, Broward, and Orange. So numerically skipping over us, we're gonna start with Miami-Dade. Third largest in the nation. 200, or I'm sorry, 510 schools. Out of those 510 schools, they have seven. Seven persistently low performing schools. That's 1%. If we go to the next largest, which is the sixth, which would be Broward County, there are 328 schools in their district. 12 persistently low performing schools. So now we're looking at 4%. We skip us, go to Orange County, 258 schools, also 12 persistently low performing schools. 5%. Then the 10th of the 10, Palm Beach County, 234 schools, four persistently low performing schools. So that's 2%. When we look at our 297 schools in Hillsborough County with 39 persistently low performing schools, that's 13%. 13% of our schools are not doing what we expect our educational institutions to do, and that's get our students to where they are proficient in those areas that we are we were measuring achievement. Once again, that's not a shot at the teachers and the administrators who are working day in, day out, blood, sweat, and tears, dedicating their lives to those students. They need help. They need help. Of those 39 schools, seven have been a D or an F for five straight years. That's an entire generation of students who we're not educated at what we have deemed is even just moderately acceptable. Out of the nine schools that the Schools of Hope are focusing on here, uh, it's important to understand that the average of those students who are on grade level from the 18-19 school year, the average of all those nine schools in ELA, 26%. 26% of those students are considered proficient and on grade level. In math, 24%. So when we walk down, if we round up, and obviously 24 should round down to 20, but we'll say you, you're going to count that, that, that fourth of that 0.4 of a person, right? So if we round up, that means three out of every 10 students you walk in the halls of those, of those schools to meet is proficient in reading and math. That's unacceptable. 30%, that's an F on any grade scale, whether you're doing minus grades, plus grades, or whatever. This is an opportunity for us to be intentional with our collaboration and our focus for these students and these families. 
So as we're discussing, I encourage you, and we ask questions, and as we approach our perspective on, on Schools of Hope and how we can leverage this opportunity for collaboration for our students, that we maintain our focus and understanding that it's what's best for students. Once again, thank you all for uh, allowing me to be here today, and we are preparing for questions. I want to welcome uh, Mr. Adam Miller to join Dr. DeLang and myself. Um, um, Dr. Graham, can you introduce, um, is it Dr. Miller or Mr. Miller? Mr. Good morning, Mr. Miller. Um, with a quick introduction, Mr. Miller, then we'll get started with Q&A. Um, can you just introduce yourself? Thank you. you bet. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, Adam Miller. I'm the Vice President of Policy and Advocacy for Idea Public Schools. Well, we welcome you. And uh, board members, I know that there are questions to be asked. If you can go ahead and uh, indicate uh, if you want to ask a question, um, our co-chair, Dr. Hahn, will write your name down and then we'll get to you in the order. I will say uh, also, uh, board members, just to facilitate that not just one uh, or two of us are talking and asking, let's go ahead and do the three minutes. But this time, let's make sure all your questions are done, uh, one right after the other, and then give the um, staff member or plural um, guests uh, a chance to answer. So three minutes for your questions, uh, one by one, in terms of getting them all out at one time. And then, of course, uh, the reciprocal um, answers will be given by the experts. Um, and let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Dr. Hahn, Member Hahn, who do we have first? Uh, member Perez, who Me is, I believe, on the phone. Okay. Or video. I don't know where she Yes. Okay, Member Perez, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Good morning. How are Good you? Good morning. Go ahead, uh, Member Perez. Yes. So can you go back to the two equity pictures, please, the slides? Which one? Yes, those two slides. Okay, so we, we see um, that you were speaking about um, that that um, that slide, you know, where um, they move over the crates, I guess, so the one that can't see over the fence is able to And this slide. Can you move over to the next slide? Yes, and now, now this slide shows the one with disabilities. So, and you said this is the newer slide. My problem with the slide is that there's still a dividing fence. Instead of our students being in with everyone else, there's still a fence that divides them. Um, so how do we as a district show whether it's in in the charter schools or in Hillsborough County, demonstrate to our students that that fence is no longer there. That dividing fence no longer separates our students from all the other students in Hillsborough County. That would be the new that that would be the new photo. Uh, that would be a new updated photo. Member for Perez, now Dr. Graham 20, just put up 21. the most current photo for you. Dr. Graham just put up the most current photo. Um, uh -huh. so I'm sorry, I just wanted to let you know. I don't know if you can see it. I can. So, Member Perez, is your question then the dividing fence, uh, or do you have another one after that? No, the dividing fence. Okay, thank you very much. To put up the di dividing fence. Um, you know, okay, so we're going to go ahead and there's still that fence that divides them. Okay, we're going to excuse me. We're going to go ahead and allow um, our guest panelists to answer. A great question, uh, Member Perez, um, Dr. Graham, or Member Perez. I, I couldn't agree with you more, and that's why I have offered the the third version of of this, where there is no fence, and we're not we're looking at a, a more equal playing field, in which we're not establishing any barriers, but we're providing the support for all students, regardless of where they fall within that needs spectrum. 
And, and through the chair, Ms. Perez, openly, I, I do not dis disagree. This is a wonderful um, visionary of, of what we're trying to accomplish over the last 13 months. While we've been driving through a pandemic, we put a lot of systems in place. And those that have consistency to make certain that every one of our schools have strong tier one, grade level equivalent experiences, but at the same time being able to identify tier two and tier three structures and support from a curriculum standpoint, just allow our children to be pushed and, and to accelerate the learning and to be able to address uh, any unfinished learning. And on top of that, being able to look at what type of additional personnel needs to be put into place in order to allow our children to be successful. Some of our schools have literacy coaches, math coaches, uh, writing coaches, science coaches, STEM offerings, robot, you know, robotics, you name it. Whatever the, the overarching need may be, we've been very unapologetic about the services that we would address from an equity lens. And hence the reason you will see as we transition to the 21-22 school year and this year as well, we tried to consistently protect transformational schools, those schools who need us the most, regardless of, of what financial situation we may be, being able to look at um, each individualized schools within the transformational uh, network and also schools outside of it, uh, overarchingly to allow our children to compete. So we, we're consistently, it's in the forefront, and, and I love this illustration because this is the, the, the foundation of all that we do. You have to have that foundation and then build upon but holistically based on whether it's mental health needs, whether it's um, uh, wraparound services through community partnership schools needs, uh, you know, we will leverage every resource we can in order to uh, improve the experience. Thank you, Superintendent Davis and Dr. Graham. Um, uh, Madam uh, Hunt, who's our next Thank you. I'm going to ask uh, two quick questions next, oh. and then we have Member Vaughn and Member Washington and Member Combs. Okay. Uh, um, Member Han, you are recognized. Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, one, could you please let us know when the contract was initially signed um, with the district? Or maybe I can rephrase that. Was the contract signed um, under you or initially? I believe it was. I believe it was Superintendent Aikens. Yes, ma'am. Can we get some this, confirmation? Uh, I can confirm was. this hasn't come under my leadership. So We're okay. So it was. I'm sorry because it was some time ago. So I couldn't remember if it was 2019 or 20. So it was 2019. Um, and I get this. Que and I'm sure many of us get questions from our constituents when items like this come to the board and we approve them and um, you know could could uh, maybe Chintia could discuss um, oh, there you are. Um, the penalties for not approving a hope operator in your district what would the penalties be for this district if this was not approved in 2019 again um, yes so by law, by legislation, uh, the district, any district, has 60 days uh, from the date that uh, the notice of intent and uh, performance-based agreement um, are submitted to us. And within that 60 days, uh, we take a look at uh, the performance-based agreement. Uh, we communicate with um, the HOPE operator uh, to determine the, um, you know, the, the legalities, the ambition of uh, the, uh, the goals, uh, and then agree to uh, bring it forth uh, to the board. Um, and that has to be approved by the school board and executed within that 60 days. If we don't, do not uh, do all this within the 60 days uh, timeline, then again, there is a financial uh, penalty, so to speak, uh, for our district, um, in as much that um, it, the administration fee that um, we collect uh, from serving all charter schools in our portfolio is um, uh, goes from a 5% or a 2% depending on whether a charter school is high performing or not and it uh, all of them are uh, diminished to 1% until uh, the school board approves that performance based agreement. Thank you. Do Thank we you. have um, a, um, a number of what, you know, the financial impact that that would cause? And if not, maybe we can get it. I think that's important for all board members to understand. 
and that's yeah, a very the, good the question. Re, the right. rules, yeah. the regulations, as mm -hmm. well as the penalties yeah. and the public are okay. considered. Sure, and I, I kind of calculated it, uh, 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 kind of foreseeing something, uh, a question like that, uh, and I calculated it based on what the administration, what we've collected of administrative fees as of today, uh, and it, and again, that is uh, $2,909,794. Um, and if we had to reduce that to 1%, it would come up to $624,526. So instead of collecting almost $3 million, we would only collect almost half a, a half little a over a half a yes. million, yes. which I'm sure would have huge implications for and finances. So I just think that's important that, yeah, you know, this, that this was, um, you know, we would have been heavily penalized financially. Um, so thank you. I appreciate it. And Dr. Graham, thank you for your presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Member Hahn. And our next uh, questionnaire Jesse, would be Member Vaughn. Member Vaughn, you are now recognized. If you could remember to ask your questions so we can um, make sure that we're getting a full array of uh, responses and questions from every board member. Thank you. Three minutes. Thank you. Um, I am going to take off my mask because we're all vaccinated um, and you can hear me better. Um, so I will try to stay within that structure, but some of my questions are relying on answers. So it's not going to be like I can just do that. Um, but I want to start off by saying I appreciate this conversation from the lens of finally talking about equity and equality. And I think that's important. Um, some of the concerns I have as we go through this, this slideshow is that what it screams to me is that so much of equity and equality when we're talking about supporting our most marginalized students in communities that have um, bared the brunt of systemic racist and socioeconomic uh, policies is that it really revolves around access to money and resources, whether or not we can fund the programs, the support, the training, all of the extra resources we would be talking about. Is it, it really comes down to access of funding. So for me, when I identify systemically, when we talk about supporting all students and making sure that we're looking at the best academic outcome. My question is, why are we identifying certain schools that can work outside of the parameters of our traditional public schools with different accountability methods as one way of talking about equity and looking at our funding sources when we could systemically be having this conversation about how we fund all of our schools at, at the traditional public level and putting more funding into our traditional public schools in these areas to be able to access the same resources. Because my concern is, you know, as we put a few of these schools in some neighborhoods, not all students are going to be able to access them at the same time. And even within these neighborhoods, not all students are going to be able to access them. So you have some students who are going to stay within our traditional public schools who are going to have less funding and less resources as students who can access these traditional, these new schools might have the benefit. So why wouldn't we holistically, if we've identified that what is really going to be able to affect um, equality within our schools, why would we identify it across the board every school, every school district. Because when we talk about like Miami-Dade and we talk about Orange County in relation, they have opportunities funding that we don't have. Whether it's they've passed an internal tax and they can levy more money for operational fees or they have million dollar beachfront <laughs> property and they have real estate taxes. The difference between their district and our district is their access to financial resources. So they can offer more to their schools that are struggling. Okay. So I 30 look at, more seconds. And I have so many more questions. I'll have a second chance, right? Yes. So I'm wondering about enrollment, how we allow students into the school, if it looks like a lottery. Um, you know, I'm looking at uh, accountability. I know several districts have signed on when we passed the bill, 7069, to fight this because they felt that there were a lot of challenges and problems. And I want to know about the outcome of that and why the districts specifically fought these schools of hope. Um, and uh, administration fees. I know that we've talked about that being an unfunded mandate date as it is, that while charter schools give us some administration fees, the, the services that we offer don't necessarily cover the revenue that we get from these fees. And as we look at decreasing fees from these schools, that's another unfunded Good mandate time. that puts a uh, strain on our, our, our traditional public schools. So those are those. that's the way I kind of want to navigate Remember, this conversation. Remember, Vaughn, you've brought Done. up, no, 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 you've brought up some great points, <laughs> the crux of the argument, and I know 
that you're remember uh, we board members we know that uh, member Vaughn was the one that brought this workshop to the forefront so those questions that she's coming multiple uh, are in her mind for maybe many many weeks uh, the best you can do please uh, offer your answers go absolutely uh, I'm gonna defer to Mr. Miller in terms of specifics for enrollment because he can speak specifically from the idea school perspective uh, to address the the questions in terms of what Miami-Dade and Broward and those schools are or those districts are able to do district-wide I'm going to respond with that is where you all have the opportunity to be that voice for what is needed for the schools uh, we have to remember what the role of the Department of Education is and that is to enforce the law we don't write the law and we aren't the ones who are deciding how much money is going where and whatnot. We are given and we are tasked with the responsibility of enacting and, and enforcing what has already been established. So when we start talking about who, how we can impact those decisions that are made legislatively, that's when we go and we talk to our, our senators and our representatives and make sure that they understand what the needs of our community are. So I, you bring up some incredible points and I couldn't agree with you more. How are we as the board collaborating with what's happening within the Hillsborough County, Greater Tampa Bay area to provide those opportunities and those access to those additional funds and then intentionally funneling those into those areas of need. Uh, we absolutely should be funding and providing them with those opportunities. But because systemically and generationally it has not happened, that's how we have gotten where we are now, where there is a need to be intentional and specific at this time to help the students who are here currently, not the ones in the future who could benefit from that legislation that you mentioned. We all know that it takes time, right? So what can we do in the current so we don't lose these group of students who are coming through the system right now. Oh, question to get back in the queue. Mr. Miller, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, Board Member Vaughn. Um, so for the enrollment question, uh, I'm going to go back in time a little bit. And Chintia talked about the, the process of negotiating the charter contract with the school district. Um, and while we were in the process of negotiating, there's a, a part of the contract that we are supposed to set out our projected enrollment in terms of what percentage of our students are coming from persistently low performing schools because of course that is the whole purpose of, of this law that was passed. And the district was, was um, very insistent that we set that target high and we set it at 75%. Fast forward to our, our process, the law requires that we provide enrollment priority for kids coming from persistently low performing schools and from kids living in opportunity zones, which are, of course are economically distressed areas. We received uh, somewhere right around 2,000 applications for about 1,000 seats. We held three separate lotteries. The first lottery was just for kids that were in the nine closest persistently low performing schools. The second lottery, we gave those kids priority first and then we went to all persistently low performing schools and opportunity zones. Then we had our third lottery, which was another month down the road. Again, first crack was kids from the nine persistently low performing schools, all persistently low performing schools and opportunity zones, and then anybody else if we had seats. And as of the last numbers I saw, um, which was you know, a week or two ago, of the kids that have accepted seats, more than 80% have come are coming from persistently low performing our opportunity zones. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Um, and through your answers, we'll have probably some more questions, but I appreciate that. Um, board member Han, who's next on the uh, Member Washington. Member Washington, you are recognized. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Graham, Mr. Miller, Dr. Delane. Uh, I have a quick question, and I think it's important, because when I look, all these schools are in District 5, majority of them. And uh, it's something to keep in mind because we're always trying to make District 5 one of the best districts in the state of Florida, <clears throat> without a doubt. Um, I need to know, and if, if you could, Mr. Miller, help me out on this. How many, how many students, though, go to, say, the Hope schools and then they're sent back to the public school system because of failure? Would you, could you, do you have any numbers on that? Yeah, well, I can get you specifics. Obviously, we're not operating in Florida yet, so we don't have any examples of, of Florida. Um, 
and it, I want to be really clear that that we, um, you know, when students come to our schools and they enroll, we want those kids to stay with us all the way through. Right. We also embrace choice, and if families make decisions, we're going to support that family in, in their decision to go to another school. Um, the only data point that I can remember off the top of my head, um, and I can, I'll be happy to get you actual data from Texas. Okay. When we look at um, the what, what Texas refers to as attrition, which is the percentage of the, the kids who start in ninth grade, how many of those kids end up staying with you all the way through twelfth grade and graduating. And and the Texas Department of Education publishes this data for every district in the state, including IDEA. And I believe that our percentage was 77 percent and and that was higher than every other district that we were in so all of the surrounding districts were were either right there or significantly lower than that and I'll be happy to get some some more data on that I know that this year Again, we, we update this data every day on our system, and we, we look at it every day. I didn't look at it today, but our student persistence for this year is upwards of 95%. So 95% of the kids that have started with us this year are still are still with us. That's great. That's great. 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 Good, great. But I just want to I just want to say I'm all for students now. You know, I, I want what's best for students because uh, that's how we operate in Hillsborough County. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Member Washington. Quick question, um, Mr. Miller, why isn't our local representative of Schools of Hope, Jolene, uh, here versus... She is she actually. Is here. Oh, yes. I apologize. And that's my fault for not introducing Jolene and Krista Thomas, our VP of Schools, are both here. Because they can feel yep. free to also speak locally yep. um, and uh, perhaps sit accordingly in case you're asked questions. Yep. Thank you. Um, uh, Co-Chair uh, co Member Hahn, who's uh, our next speaker? Member Combs. Oh, Member Combs, you are recognized. Um, good morning, and thank you so much for coming today. Um, I, ha I have several questions. One of my questions is, we know that the teacher is a very important part of student success. Um, professional development, certification in our district, we're really pushing with reading endorsement. Um, from my understanding, you know, coming from the DOE, do your teachers have to be state certified, and what percentage do they have to be? Is it 100%, or do your teachers have to be state certified? Chair. I'm good. Through, through, through to Chair. Um, thank you. Uh, oh, Mr. Miller, you're recognized. I apologize. Okay. I take notes about every two seconds, so uh, thank you for it's, your patience. It's, it's the uh, old bureaucrat in me. I always wait for the chair to recognize. Well, that's so. the right way. Right. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Um, so you're right, Member Combs. So the statute uh, does uh, provide uh, the flexibility for HOPE operators to use non-certificated teachers in the classroom if they choose to. I can tell you that IDEA understands you know, teachers are the most important lever that we have in terms of, of increasing academic achieve, student academic achievement. Um, and you know, while we have that flexibility and we appreciate it, we anticipate that the vast majority of our teachers will be certified. So in fact, we actually submitted to the state um, approval, uh, a plan to be um, our own, our, offer our own, I'm gonna take this off for a minute, our own professional development certification program. Um, which would allow us to provide all of the training, mentorship, coursework, and hours that a teacher with a temporary certificate needs to move to their professional certificate. Right. Um, and we also submitted, again, although we weren't required to, to the district, our teacher evaluation system, um, because we, again, we believe that that um, you know like the teachers in the classroom are going to be the most important, the most important variable, in whether we're successful or not. Okay, and then my follow-up question, and it's really important for me because I think we lose some wonderful teachers in our district every year for Hillsborough County Public Schools that aren't certified. So I, it, it's just, I'm trying to understand why there's different rules for a Schools of Hope. And then the other important thing is the wraparound services. Whoops, sorry. Uh, yeah, finish those two questions. Yeah, so my other question is finish. the importance of wraparound services as far as, um, you know, providing um, s uh, speech, all kinds of mental health counseling. What, and we, as a district, we do a great job with wraparound services. What specific wraparound services can a child who comes to your school with special needs and, and um, 
provides. Just sure. detailed the wraparound services they can expect from your schools. To the chair? Yeah, Thank great you. question, you, uh, Member Combs. Uh, mem uh, Mr. Miller, you're recognized. So I'm going to um, ask Krista to fill in here, but one thing I do want to point out is that because we are um, consider our own LEA for federal funding purposes, we are, we are required, just like the district, to provide all ESE services. So we serve the full continuum and we'll provide everything that's on the student's IEP. And then Krista, if you want to talk a little bit about additional wraparound. Good morning. Um, so for each school, we have a school counselor. It's a full-time school counselor. So that's for each of our four schools, both the elementary and the middle and high school. Um, for each campus, K through 12, we have a social worker that will start full-time um, our first year, starting this August. And then we also have a partnership to have a mindfulness director for each of our campuses um, that will support in each week, 25 hours um, on each campus as well. Within our academic day, our schedule, we have our social-emotional curriculum, which is Move This World, um, that's supported through our school counselors in support of our teachers and staff as well and then we also have a partnership with frameworks that supports and coaches each of our staff members on social emotional learning thank you for that answer and we'll get back and in queue. am i i guess i have to go back into the queue because i have several questions regarding yeah, back that. into the queue okay. you go um, thank you, Member Combs, and uh, yeah, these are important questions, and, and the, uh, I, I believe I'm next, so I'll recognize uh, my member, uh, Co-Chair Han, may uh, Member Gray speak? Yes, and since we're not, I mean, we have plenty of time today, so, um, you know, we'll, I don't think we really need to limit the amount of time that people get into the queue, and, um, you know, and maybe we could relax the three minutes just a little bit if everyone would agree to two questions at a time and then get back in the queue and that way we'll save from you know being interrupted but okay, that would so, just be my thoughts yeah okay let me go ahead and just make my comment and then we'll go back to another round of the queue uh, thank you member Hahn uh, what I am going to say too is uh, getting back to me member Vaughn and and her heartfelt uh, desire to have this uh, workshop and member Combs probably likewise um, you know, we are a public school district and we're very proud of it and uh, Superintendent Davis uh, would, uh, has made some comments regarding uh, how we want to become more competitive. So we know the history of the Schools of Hope was decided upon by Superintendent Davis, the die, I mean Superintendent Aikens, so the die has been cast uh, probably in early, and uh, Van Ayers, you may, um, you may correct me, but early in 2019 perhaps the uh, consequence of the schools of hopes from Texas is that there is a huge PAC for public schools because what's happening is a lot of the public schools now are folding in areas of Texas because of the schools of hope which is brings us to this particular workshop we are fearful of having these buildings these wonderful beautiful buildings of yours right next to our schools which of course have aged um, and we we recognize that we surely do want every board member here is definitely on the train of making our students prepared for, yes, uh, Dr. Dre, a better life. Um, and there's no question about that. This board is very involved with that. But our fear, of course, when we see, and this will go to Member Washington, when we see that Schools of Hope are advertising uh, to go to their school in various community settings, we are seeing that they're robbing Peter to pay Paul, uh, Paul's us, and uh, they are definitely trying to get students into their schools. This has a certain rub, uh, as you can imagine, with uh, school board members, um, I'll just say myself. We know the reality is here, um, but the frustration is also. And you are a public school former teacher of the year. We have another teacher of the year here. We have two other teachers and a professor. So we're very much in education uh, and not, not withholding from, um, and I always say Member Snavely has a small classroom, four children in public schools. And uh, so we are, we are very much feeling compelled to make statements not at you, but we are frustrated from the De Department of Education and what we are going to see because now our Superintendent Davis with very little resources that we have from the Department of Education, as you well know, we are now 
having to make up for lost ground, uh, as you indicated. Uh, and the question is, there is no question. This is the reality. This is why this workshop is happening. Uh, and uh, Superintendent Davis, maybe I will ask you, here's the question. Superintendent Davis, what are we going to do about recruitment? We are going to face lower FTE in these schools. We know that. That's going to represent a lower amount of money. What are we going to do also about recruitment that would uh, match that? concern. Yes, Mr. the Chair. First and foremost, we've got to continue to tell our story. And, and, and I know right now we're going through some, some really trying times of, of where we are due to financial historical practices. Um, however, during this process, you know, we still have some great initiatives, some great programs, some hard work, dedication of our, of our teachers, and some programs that many others throughout the state and this nation do not have, and those that can potentially become national models. So we've got to tell our story. And we're working right now with a marketing plan with our communications team to be able to do just that because openly we know the more that we we flood social media, we flood uh, our community with the highlights, the celebrations of where we are and who we are, the better we will become uh, as a school district. Now, there's always times that and barriers that are in front of us and openly, you know, when, when we have the persistently low performing schools in which we identify 39 most in the, in the state, it openly creates angst from parents about how they can put their child in the best educational setting that they can. And this is why uh, openly we have additional resources to help those schools, whether it's UNICEF grants, whether it's Title I funding, all those goes over and beyond to be able to address uh, certain subsets of learners and communities that need us to need our help the most. But overall, we've got to get to a point where we're talking about the highly certificated teachers that we have that are high impact and yield high impact every single day the thriving, robust programs that we will continue to offer in all of our schools, what the continuity of pathways may be, how we will provide ongoing interventions, what does it look like to expand the co and extracurricular activities in a comprehensive schools within Hillsborough County. Those are the stories that we have to tell and continue to highlight exemplar teachers, support professionals, leaders, and allow them to, you know, to be able to market their individualized school as well. So it's got to be a coordinated effort. We stand ready to go and hope to, in the same way that we launched it in the middle of the year, December, after we closed the, the first semester, we launched a campaign about a, a safe, social, successful orientation of Hillsborough County, and we had kids that selected us after they had a different learning platform to come back, and we, um, we did it to tell the great things accomplished, and we'll do just that as we move through the summer. Thank you, Superintendent Davis, and just be thinking when the uh, other board members are going to have another round of questions, no doubt. Member Snyder, did you want to ask any questions? Because I didn't want to leave you out. No, I don't necessarily have any questions to ask. I do have some comments to make, and I don't mind making them now. If You're recognized. Fine. Thank you very much, Member uh, Gray. Um, first, um, this is a little bit, I don't know if this will take my three minutes, if I could pause it for a second, because I just wanted to take an opportunity to recognize um, something special about Dr. Graham. Um, he, uh, because I don't know when we're going to be able to do this and see each other uh, like this again, um, the, Univer the University of Florida recognizes 40 alumni under, four, under the age of 40 every year. It's a very uh, big deal in the, the realm of alumni. And I just wanted to recognize that Dr. Graham was uh, just honored with the distinction of being 40 under under the age of 40 for the University of Florida. And so just want to congratulate, take a moment to congratulate Thank you. you. Um, we love recognizing our homegrown. Um, life is good. Life is good. <laughs> and, um, and Heather Hanks, who's the assistant principal at Plant City High School, also was recognized for being um, 40 individuals under the age of 40 who have made significant impact to the state of Florida, to, to, to the United States, and um, just wanted to take that. 
second. So thank you for the opportunity to do that. Okay, so um, thank you for the presentation. I really like this slide because it encompasses, I think, um, well, it makes us think differently about it because you're right, the traditional version of that um, doesn't include leaving the box under the individual that had the, um, it was already able to see over the fence but maybe just needed a little push. And I appreciate your comments about um, not necessarily taking from one group of, of students to give to another group of students because there are uh, groups of students that do need to be pushed a little bit harder and we need to not neglect those students as well and create opportunities for resources for those students. So, um, you know, we're bound a lot of, uh, to, of what we do in our school district by the legislature. It seems like year after year um, the legislature does uh, create additional mandates and um, um, that's why it's always uh, uh, very um, uh, important for the school board to be involved in legislative advocacy and uh, we, we've talked about this and I hope we can get a chance to talk about it before the workshop is over about some of the other legislation that's coming down the pike this session um, but what I really want to say at the end of the day is um, that we hired as a school board um, uh, the last school board group of, of, of members we hired Mr. Davis for a very specific reason because we needed someone who could move the work because it is not acceptable to have 13% of our schools low performing schools. It is not acceptable to have only three out of 10 students meet the um, requirements or be uh, um, capable of reading and mathematics at the level they should be. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't foresee it, but a global pandemic came and there's a lot of things that we've had to put on the back burner. But I will say there are a lot of things that we haven't put on the back burner that Mr. Davis has been able to do. Um, not necessarily ideal timing or situation to have to do these things. Not necessarily what he signed up for when he applied for this position as superintendent of our school district, but he's he's rallied and he has come around to do a lot of the things that need to be done in order to move the work. And that includes um, hiring the right people for the, for the positions that require the instructional leadership necessary to move this work. And so I look forward to seeing uh, what you've already started in the school district and I hope that next time we meet or next year, a year from now or two years from now, we can say that we have reduced that percentage from 13 to zero. Absolutely. And however long it takes, I know that you're committed to do that and I, I look forward to continuing to see your work in that area, in that space, because that is why. We didn't hire you to come in and fix our finances. We didn't hire you to come in and address a global pandemic. We hired you because of your instructional leadership and your ability to move schools to the next level for our students' benefit, period. Thank you. Thank you, Member Snively. Very well said. And uh, as you can see, we, we are very honored uh, Dr. Graham to have you uh, part of this discussion. Superintendent Davis, uh, Member Snively also, uh, we are reminded too that um, Superintendent Davis also allowed the expansion of African American studies, uh, which is huge for the high need schools and I know Member Washington is part of that uh, committee. So uh, why don't we go ahead, we are relaxing Dr. Hahn a little bit. I know that we might have a legislative update uh, that we want to cover. So we have another um, time for another round and um, Member Perez, would you like to go ahead and start again and we'll just go right through the queue? Um, she did not. She's. Uh, she was on. I have two other people. Okay. Oh, the Member case. Han, who's the next person in line? Uh, and I just want to quickly say that you know I echo your comments, Member Snively, that um, you know for those board members that weren't on, you know, who are new, um, there was a great sense of urgency to turn these schools around after you know, years of, of um, struggling. And every year that those schools remain in a D or F or struggling status as a year lost to those students, the year lost to their future. And so, um, 
you know, it's it's just imperative that we remember that the instructional piece and moving those schools is really, it, it has gotten lost in the last year with COVID. So mm -hmm. I, I'm hoping that this conversation brings it back into the, you know, a priority again and making it a topic of our, of our conversations. Um, thank you. Um, so Member Vaughn. Member Vaughn, you are recognized. Oh, thanks. It feels like it took forever to get back here. <laughs> um, thank you. So from understanding your lottery system, it sounds like there are students who have interest in the program who are not able to get into just based on your ability to accommodate. And with my previous questions, I'm not sure if we got into why the other counties fought this legislation. I know I asked that, but we'll come back to it. But essentially, um, your answer was, why can't we roll this out on a larger scale level to address all of our schools and, and the systemic problems, and I heard that you know that requires a lot of resources, and we're working in the confines of the legislation, and we want to be able to help whichever students we can right now. And I appreciate that because you know we do have to help whichever students we can. But when we go back to trying to do the best for all students, again, my concern is what's the plan here? Are these schools going to eventually take over all of the schools in our low-performing areas and allow access for all students? Are they going to um, um, be there and compete with our traditional public schools. What happens to our traditional public schools as these schools of hope move in for the students who aren't able to access them and aren't able to navigate the lottery system or who you know aren't able to get access to the schools? What does that mean for those students? I don't understand when we're talking about because the legislation is the one who created this, who's wrote the policies and the, the accountability measures and allotted more money to these schools. Why, even if it's a small area, we wouldn't test this in our traditional public schools because these are public dollars that are funding schools to address these inequities. So when we're talking about, you know, it's at the state legislator, they've created this, but why haven't we created it or why isn't it talked about being done within our traditional public schools so there's not only a group of students who can access it and benefit it while other students can't because that's not addressing what's best for all students, it's addressing what's best for the students who have felt failed by our school district who can now navigate and access these schools. And then to go to that, I'm wondering, we talked about some of the differential between hiring certified teachers and what that looks like. And I'm wondering, is there also a difference in testing accountability or how we grade our teachers or what that looks like? And if there is a, dis a, a difference, why again is that not being implemented completely in our public schools? If that's a benefit that allows these students to access more, to have more, why would we limit that to a specific group of schools that can offer that instead of doing it in our traditional public schools, even on a small scale. If we can't do it to all our traditional public schools, why wouldn't we pick these 10 or 15 schools and invest the same energy on a public level so that the students who live in that neighborhood, the students who go to those schools benefit from it as opposed to students who can navigate a lottery system? Um, so that's my question. No, those are great questions. Um, uh, and you guys are having a challenge to answer many in-depth questions. Thank you, Member Vaughn. And um, would you be, uh, if, if Dr. I can Graham, start, yes, uh -huh. uh, it, it, to be, and, and no disrespect with this comment, uh, but that's, that conversation isn't happening because you're not at the House or in the Senate. I would love to see you in a position like that where you can be introducing those ideas to the education community and the committee um, up there that are making those decisions. And I, you bring up some incredible points. But what we see is that we're having to operate in what is currently established. And so it, it, without wiping all educational legislation and starting over from an area where we can just create whatever we want, that's where what we talked about earlier with that definition of equity, where we're creating systems within the currently established systems to be very intentional and surgical with identifying those those areas. What well, we well, the, the royal we. I mean, is when we talk about the the those. I guess technically would be the legislator that is establishing that, okay. and then we are executing it okay. with that with the best fidelity possible to have these targeted areas. So it's when you have those systems that are being established, it would be great to have your voice at that table to say, hey, why are we not looking at it like this? Why are we not looking at it like that? I think that that question, while incredibly pertinent doesn't really allow us to provide the answer I think that you're looking for because that's not our, that, that we don't have any control over that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, but I mean, it's, you're, you're hitting all the nails on the head, but that falls under a different area of government than, than what we're responsible for. 
So, and, and, and I completely agree with, with many of the things that, that you brought up, many of the points. Uh, Dr. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Miller, and then uh, Superintendent Davis yes, would like Miller. to speak as well. You're recognized, Mr. Miller. Thank you, Chair Gray. Um, I'll just speak to a couple of your questions. One on the, on the testing accountability is exactly the same. So our, our kids take the state assessments just like every other public school student in the state. We receive a school grade just like every other public school in the state, and we can be closed if our performance doesn't meet the academic objectives that we set out. Um, so that is that is that is the same. Um, I would also uh, just to echo a little bit um, of, of what Dr. Graham said is you know there there have been some oper or some some attempts to provide school districts with the same type of opportunity in pilot programs over the years. Um, you know I can't speak to why or why not or why they have or have not continued or been successful, but I know there have there have been. So I think I, I think people would be very open to those ideas. Can I just clarify one thing? I'm sorry. I know I'm being a time hog, but this is a, 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 to my heart. Um, is I think some parents are um, hoping that the testing guidelines would be different because from what I'm hearing in my community, especially in marginalized communities and, and black and brown communities, that they feel that our standardized testing is racist in thought process and it's not really academically supporting our students and it's not a good measure and it's not culturally appropriate. So this would not be an alternative to that. If, if we've identified that maybe in those communities that testing isn't necessarily affected since it's standardized and it's for the standard, these schools don't bypass that. Because I've heard some parents ask that question and, and in hopes that they would be able to deviate from the standardized testing by accessing these schools. Okay, there's a question. Let's have an answer and then we'll go into uh, Superintendent Davis. You know, I mean, the, st the state assessment requirements are exactly the same. Now, we may have different interim assessments and different assessments throughout the year than the district provides, but the state, the FSA, that's all exactly the same. You're welcome. And as you're aware, the standards are changing. Okay, thank you. Um, Superintendent Davis, did you want to make, make a remark about uh, those questions? Yes, thank I just you. want to re revert back to Mrs. Vaughn's original questions about a question about why do school districts openly push back due to this legislation? And this is all about school districts truly trying to fight to be able to keep their schools within their organization. The issue becomes is that historically you've seen the same, you know, plot, the, the same cycle of thinking, call it in a vacuum, and related to keeping the same leadership, the same mentality, the same, and expecting different outcomes. And it, di it didn't change. So I think there was a push back to be able to, to keep schools because that's what we, you know, no superintendent wants to to have an under persistently underperforming school and have to close. Uh, when we, when I signed uh, last January or two Januarys ago uh, in 2020, you transitioned in. I immediately after the assignment went to Tallahassee to fight for Oak Park and Foster for them because they were supposed to close this year, and they gave them back to to me, understanding that my wheelhouse is instructional process. And and then you know here we are again looking at the same process with a, a crazy year of the pandemic. But openly, I would say just I, I think leaders and in, in in superintendents were just trying to be champions for their schools, but you just can't be a champion for your school. You have to be willing to address the equity issues, and you've got to be willing to change ways of work that are truly going to transform uh, not only the mindsets, but overall the culture in the school, and it doesn't start just with students, but it has to be holistic throughout the entire community. And I think that's the biggest push from this legislation. Are you? What are you going to do differently when you have schools for decades that haven't that haven't moved the needle and given children a sense of hope. I'm just going to tell you openly, we're, we're going to move, you know, the next time we have that conversation, we will not have 39 schools that are persistently low. We will move that needle, even during a pandemic through that process, you'll see movements. Excellent. That's what we want to hear. Uh, and I know that you all want to hear the same thing. I, I truly do. So, um, Member Hahn, what's our next speaker? Uh, Who's Member our next? Combs. Member Combs, I know you have a litany of questions, and I apologize for for maybe not letting you say them all, but hopefully this time. Go, girl. Well, I'm going to try to just chunk it out into a short question. So one of the things that uh, one of my concerns is um, the federal government last year, I think, gave IDEA Public Schools $186 million. With the new federal government, do you anticipate continuing to get all that additional money um, with the new federal government in place? 
Chair. Now we're into you. the federal government. Great question, Member Combs. Uh, Mr. Yeah, Miller, you're recognized. The, I, th I think the grant that you're speaking of is the charter school program grant, which yes. is a startup grant, yes. um, which we get um, an allotment per school to buy desks and computers and textbooks and chairs. Um, I, I, my ability to predict what the federal government's going to do is pretty limited. So um, I can tell you that in the initial kind of budget blueprint that the Biden administration put out, they've not yet they've not yet included um, what their approach will be to the federal charter schools program. Um, what they did put out was a significant increase in Title One funds, a significant increase in in a, in a bunch of other programs, but they've not they've not yet um, tipped their hand on on what their plans are there. Okay, so I guess my question is my concern is maybe not getting additional funding and then how are you as a you know as idea public schools there's been a lot of controversy about how you've um, maintained your money with the eight years of luxury travel that was spent traveling as well as box seats and then my other concern was just you know your CEO or received with less than 200 schools more than five hundred thousand dollars as far as the salary and we know our our superintendent who has signif significantly more schools and more responsibilities Responsibilities um, receive significantly less than that. So I'm just wondering how you're able to provide services, but your overhead and the expense that you're using um, for idea of public schools, how, how does that affect our schools or the schools that you're opening since your overhead is so much more? Okay, Mr. Miller, there's a question or two for you to answer. Uh, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure um, I understand entirely the question, but I'll try to I'll try to answer it. I mean, if the the um, you know idea over the last um, number of years. Well, let me let me back up and, and speak to the to the controversy you spoke of. Over the last 18 months, we do have a new superintendent. We have a new board chair. Um, our board's adopted and strengthened. You know, dozens of policies to ensure that we have the best controls in place so those um, those decisions can't happen again. Um, we have uh, over, I think, the last five years, we've had the highest possible fiscal integrity rating from the Texas Education Agency, which is a, a rating that they give to all school districts around the state. We um, recently, uh, our, our uh, bond rating from Standards & Poor's was maintained at an A. We're the only, I think we're the only charter network in the country Country that has an A bond rating, and it was because of our, our, our ability to manage our finances as well, our strength of leadership, and the vision for the for the district continuing to to grow and add schools. Um, we, uh, you know, really ensure um, that uh, the the um, you know the the priorities that we're we, we are focused on are making sure that our schools are doing well, and I think that we've we've got a, a track record to show that we've 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 done that. We still have room to. Grew like any any district does. We're not perfect, um, but over the last 20 years, we've been one of the highest performing school systems in the country, serving you know a population of of prime 90 percent of our kids are free and reduced price lunch, 95 percent are minority, um, and we've had you know really great success um, by focusing on making sure that we have great teachers in the classroom, great school leaders, and the resources that are there for for our students. And predominantly, you've been Mexican families are on the border. Most of the students. You haven't really dealt with a large amount of black students for Idea Public Schools. Is that my understanding? Okay, and, and we're going to answer that question, Mr. Miller, and I know that um, Member Vaughn has another question. Sure, thank you. So in our, our when, when we were, um, when we first began 20 years ago, it was in the Rio Grande Valley, um, and that's where we began growing. So those schools are predominantly Hispanic because that's the, the community we serve, as or the community that lives there. Um, and so our schools are very representative of the community. As we grew into Austin and San Antonio and Houston and Fort Worth, we began to see um, a different demographic. And of course, our schools in, in southern Louisiana are almost all African American. I think they're 75 or 80 percent. African American. Can I, can I have one, one last comment or question? I think, and Dr. Graham brought this up, I think it's very misleading when you say 100% of students attend college. Uh, that's very misleading because based on my research, when you look at, you know, and I would love to see that data more specifically, students that start in ninth grade um, and complete, you know, the attrition of how many students actually start and finish. So I think 100% is very misleading to the community. And I, I want to make sure if we can speak of that as well, I would appreciate it. Okay, there's a, 
um, a question about the 100%, and this will be uh, an answer that you'll give. And then we're going to go to Member Vaughn and following that, Member Washington for final questions. Mr. Miller, you're recognized. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, when we talk about our students that go to college, we're talking about our graduates, our kids that, that are graduating seniors that, that go to college. Um, we, of course, are not um, counting kids that decide that idea is not the right school for them, just like I don't think your district would either, that if a kid left Hillsborough County and went to Pasco or went to another district or went to private school or home school, that you would then count those kids and when you're reporting reporting um, school data. So, and I did, I, I can send to you again, I mean, we have the attrition data that, that um, shows the percentage of kids that start ninth and, and 12th and, and comparatively to all the districts that we operate in um, and be happy to, to forward that again. Okay, and uh, perhaps after this workshop, um, Member Combs, you might want to ask additional questions one-on-one, um, -on -one, so that might be a good opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Additional question, and then Member Washington, is that correct, uh, uh, Member Hahn? Am I in the right order? Yes, and we have a half hour left on the workshop, so if, I um, think, Member uh, Vaughn and Washington finish, then we can circle back to Ms. Combs, if she'd like. That's an option, and then we have also, I think Member Snively wants to do a little legislative um, talk with Kristen Davis, if that's a possibility. Well, yes. it, I think yeah. that's how we're set up the workshop if, if we got consensus the last time because Member Vaughn asked for additional the 30 time. Minutes. Right? Yeah, so after, that would be so from 12 to That would be after, right? So, yeah. I mean, 12, yes. 11.30 to 11 12. 11.30 to 11.30. I'm sorry, yes. 11 to 11.30. Bill? Uh, wait a minute, so 11.30 to 12 because we started at 9.30. 10.30, 11.30. 10.30, 11.30. So we it's have up to a the board. The workshop's scheduled from 9.30 to 11.30. It's however you want to, if you want to extend past 11.30, that's certainly up to the board, but it's been advertised. I think that's what we agreed on that's last what we agreed time. On. Yeah, last we're going to go ahead and, so uh, yeah, I, I think we'll go ahead and finish up uh, with the questions. And if Member uh, Combs has another question, um, we'll go ahead and you know, uh, get that finished as well. Uh, and we'll see where it goes. So we're still going into these um, very probing questions. Uh, Member Vaughn, did you have another question? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I appreciate you coming here. I know it's, you know, I'm going to say that, you know, I'm sure you're passionate for children and we're, we're both passionate for the same thing. Our students are marginalized communities and I know we're, we're putting you in the hot seat. Um, but it is because we, we want to make sure that, you know, we're advocating and educating the public as much as we can for, for all student success. Um, the one question that I feel like I've asked a couple times, and I know I, I fire off a lot of questions, is um, the question about when this was rolled out and, and hopes that Schools of Hope legislation was rolled out, that there were several school districts that thought this um, and, and took it to our Supreme Court, I believe, and we just had a ruling recently that came back on that. So I was wondering if you could touch on why you feel that was what motivated that, what the school districts, you know, what their concerns were, what the Supreme Court ruled, and, and address that piece of it. Sure. Okay, sure. uh, Mr. Miller. Thank you. Your remark. Um, I will, I'll test my memory. It was a while back, but um, <laughs> if I remember correctly, there were 13 school districts that filed um, that joined that lawsuit. Hillsborough County was not one of them. They did not, uh, if I remember correctly, did not join the lawsuit. Um, the lawsuit was not specifically um, uh, related to Schools of Hope. That was certainly part of it. But there were a number of provisions in that bill that school districts had concern over. There was a provision around Title I funding, how Title I funding was shared. Um, I, I can't remember. There, there was a, a concern expressed that there it, there were too many issues within the bill because it was a significant, it was a large bill, it was 180 pages or something, I think. Um, so, uh, and then a Schools of Hope, of course, was one of the concerns, and the concerns expressed by school districts was the, the process by which Hope operators came into charter schools was very different than the, the, the regular process. And so that came case was heard at the uh, circuit court and the circuit court found in favor of the state and said that it was constitutional. It was appealed to the first DCA. The DCA affirmed that decision and then the Supreme Court um, decided not to hear the case leaving the DCA ruling in place. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Member Washington? Yes, I have a... Uh, <clears throat> 
a question. When when you are doing the evaluate teacher evaluation instrument tool, is this the same that we're doing in the in the state of Florida? How how, how does that work? Mr. Miller, you're recognized. Thank you, Member Washington. Thank you. Um, it, it's not the same. Well, I, I don't know what what Hillsborough County uses. We're not. We did not adopt Hillsborough County's teacher evaluation system. We have one that we use across all of our schools across the entire network, um, and it's called Teacher Career Pathway. And it's a it's based 50 percent, if, if I remember correctly, 50 percent is based on student performance. 30 uh, percent, I believe, is based on classroom observation, and we have a rubric with 50 or 60 different metrics that we are looking at when when um, when instructional leaders are going into the classroom observing teachers uh, and then there's a percentage based on student feedback parent feedback and then observation of whether those teachers are living the core values of the organization and then every teacher is evaluated throughout the year and they end up with a with a rating uh, a one through five rating we we equated that to the state's one through four rating the unsatisfactory effective highly effective and needs improvement Improvement, um, and submitted that to the school district uh, for review and approval. Okay, I have one more question. When you, like, when you come into a, a city or wherever you're going to, do you have a facilities there, or you build a, a facility through the chair? We. Um, Sorry, Mr. Miller, That's you're okay. recognized. Thank, um, you, thank you, Member Washington. Thank you, ma'am. Um, now, we, we typically build facilities. Now, we have had some instances in, in districts that have invited us in to do partnerships where we would go in and, and work with the school district in one of their facilities. That's relatively uncommon, relatively rare occurrence. So typically, we're purchasing land and, and building a facility or purchasing an existing facility and renovating it. And you renovate it to right. a school facility. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I do not at this time um, have anyone on, on my list. So okay. if we just want to take one more, any any more questions, if you want to get in the queue. Otherwise, I'll member Gray. I'll uh, turn yes. it over. Yes, let me go ahead and um, finish this. Uh, we, we, oh, we are uh, extremely... <coughs> thankful for those questions uh, and those answers, but we do have one more board member uh, who has a question, and I think it's uh, member, member Combs. So, Member Combs, if you'll ask it, and then we'll move on to another subject matter. Thank yeah. you. I guess some of my questions are just like the overall program and what it looks like, because I have been to quite a few charter schools, and there are some things that I didn't even know as an educator until a board member. Like, I did not know that most charter schools don't have nurses, that most of them are health care workers. I mean, do you will you have a trained nurse on site like our public schools do? Yeah, question is a trained nurse on school sites, and we have a local Schools of Hope, uh, I believe it's Jolene, I hope I have the right name. Yeah, I just have some questions yeah. about the overall program and so, what that looks like as far as the support that our children need. Okay, we have that question, and uh, good morning again. Good morning. Relax, and uh, we have the question. Thank you. That, that, that's one of my questions. Do, do you, will you have a, a nurse on campus? Yeah, so we have a regional uh, registered nurse in each of our um, campuses have a clinic so to be able to support our families as well as our students on okay. campus. Okay, okay, great. And then just overall, like the wraparound services mm -hmm. as far as the number of students who are ESC and what type of support, you know, what the ratios look like. And maybe that's something that we used to have to sit down and have a meeting on because that's one of the things that I, that's most surprising to me. Um, and when I've gone out to some of the schools is just that that we they are not able to provide the type of services just because they're smaller in scale as we are as a district. Okay. Um, um, that's a question uh, yes. has been formatted, and um, Jolene, if you'll do us the honor of answering that. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes, so we support students and families just as any other school in a district would based on what the student needs, um, and then we are able to provide that based on the services that are in their in individual education plans. So what percentage do you anticipate of special needs students um, attending ideas, and what type of services do you support them in the ratios? Yeah, in terms of anticipated needs, right now we just kicked off our student registration and family registration, so we're getting that information starting up. That started April 5th, so last Monday, um, and so we're going through that process from now throughout the summer to be able to pull in exactly what is it exactly our students need and our families need in terms of that. Okay. Because in our district, we have a lot of access classes where we have a small number of students, and even sometimes we as, we see a teacher um, working alongside yeah. an aide with a student. Are you going to be able to provide those kind of intensive 
services for our special needs students? Yes, um, again, it's based on exactly what the student's individual education plan or 504 plan or whatever the needs are for them academically. Uh, we're able to also provide supports pushing into the classrooms as well as t students throughout the tier process. So we have our critical student intervention program, which we refer to as CSI, and so we're able to catch those students also based on their academic performance on each of our assessments. Each week we're pulling um, student weekly data meetings. Every day we're doing daily data dives where we're looking at student work and then determining what, is, what are the next steps for that teacher based on that student's okay. needs. And Member Combs, those are great questions and we are talking about the ESE. That was the uh, the last question, very critical question. Uh, what I uh, would like to do at this point in time, um, we're going to fold into a little bit of the unit talk um, and uh, I believe that um, Member Vaughn is satisfied with the uh, amount of time given to the subject areas that she really was very much, as you can see, uh, prepared to ask and the other board members as well. So um, I know the uh, board members will join me in sharing the appreciation to uh, Jolene. What's your last name? I'm so sorry. Um, Krista Thomas. So Jolene Robinson is the executive director and I'm the vice president of schools. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. thank you very thank much you. for being here. Mr. Miller, we thank you um, for your visit up to uh, our, yeah, it is up to our state, depending on its latitude. Okay. All right. Uh, so you have the same weather as we have? It's sunny and warm. <laughs> it is okay. I, you know, I go all over the country to run races, and I always check weather. So I, I have a tendency to ask these questions. Uh, Dr. Graham, thank you, and you are just such a heartfelt uh, uh, educator, and we really recognize and appreciate what you stand for. And please fight for us. Uh, that's really what we're looking into. Uh, we want we want our public schools to succeed, and we have a superintendent that we hired to uh, kick butt, so to see, uh, you know, uh, saying, uh, and don't put that in there, uh, Marlene. <laughs> um, so, um, but, you know, we, we're we a competitive bunch, uh, so uh, you will hopefully see that lower number from 39 to, what was that number are you going to promise, Edison Davis? Uh, zero. Okay, there it is, zero. Okay, well, uh, thank you so much, and uh, Member uh, Combs, feel free if you want to get up and ask another question. I wanted to uh, open the floor. I asked you all to bring your, your little tiny booklets here about the units. Uh, so if you have a question, I thought we'd go one round uh, around, <laughs> one round around. Uh, if you have a question, Superintendent Davis, you're probably going to be asked the question. Oh, you're getting up to the front? Oh, oh okay. Um, so, board members, I know that we've had a lot of calls a lot of emails, uh, and this is regarding the uh, everything from the career counselor. Uh, and I don't know, uh, Dr. Whalen, you may want to be up here too to answer questions. But I believe board members might have a question or two uh, to ask. And if that be true, we can get started. Uh, Member Hahn, do you have any? I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Perez is in the queue. Oh, very good. And uh, so let's go ahead and get into the queue. I figured we could do one round and then get into our um, half hour version of uh, exploration. Okay, um, Snively's in the queue. Uh, you can put me in the queue down, down, down. Okay, I uh, think we're all queuing up here. We're getting um, our experts. You wanna go last? Line up. I'll go last. Okay, that's, uh, okay. by the way, in my race, I almost placed that. Okay. Okay, let's uh, let's get ourselves reinvigorated. Good old unit cuts. Um, and of course we're titling it differently. We have the title as hold on just a second. I almost made myself laugh. Um, sorry. Uh, it was called school site allocations. All right, so uh, board members, uh, I believe we're starting, Member Hahn, are we starting with Member Perez? Yes, ma'am. All right, Member Perez, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, I, I need to find out, I know that you provided us with 
Um, it says staffing allocations um, that you identified less than 1,000 positions um, that would, would be el eliminated. And, and um, you provided the principals um, with information on um, what they needed to um, do as far as um, it says that you providing you provided staffing allocation models um, for guidance on the number of school-based administrators in accordance to the number of students enrolled and all that. So, did you provide our principals a template um, as far as what to look for so that this request would not cause harm to our students as far as what to look for when it comes to the demographics of the school, culture of the school, highly effective teachers that are working for the good of the students, and the school, as well as the years of service those teachers have and who will retire soon or close to retirement so that this does not affect them. And if you have that template, can you please provide me a copy of it? So to the chair, I, I could, first of all, thank you, Ms. Perez. I guess the template was that we gave every school a staff allocation uh, model for their schools. And please note that we didn't change anything that, has, that hasn't historically been in Hillsborough County. The only adjustments that we changed were the assistant principal. So all of the, the revenues for positions, uh, you know, counselors, and all the other elements and support staff remain the same. Overall, currently, we're just implementing that model that has historically been in front of principals. And principals were part of that process uh, many times through collaborations, conversations, through ma master schedule reviews, individualized conversations with regional superintendents, with chiefs, uh, with human resources, with Title I, uh, you know, funding, all to be able to identify what uh, allocations will be used and leveraged at their particular school and openly. As you start looking the, the you know when you look at elementary, it's all driven by the number of students that they currently have to make certain that we have and meet class size as identified through choice, and at the same token, same, makes, in that same token through um, in that same token through secondary. Sorry, I got to read uh, and through secondary school secondary courses and master schedules are built based on student requests. So, you know, while student, you know, you may have a large student request for journalism this year, and, uh, you know, for next year as those requests go out, that number can significantly be reduced if that program initiative pathway is not marketed, and then you may have to make an adjustment in what uh, you offer for the following year because it's driven by students. Um, I'll let Ms. Dr. Welling speak about anything related to overall um, Personnel. I think the, uh, the last part of the question was protecting those who've been in the system for a while. Um, as it relates to, to schools, it's all based on evaluation, and I'll let Dr. Whalen speak to that. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Um, yes, we follow uh, the contractual process and first seek for where there will be a reduction, and if it's not a current vacancy, we have looked at um, the retirements as well all the way through August the 31st to look at um, having as much minimal impact on current employees that are with us. But it's also by um, their particular, what we call pool category or their current assignment. So we take volunteers that's based on seniority. Then we look at our staff members that have no evaluation score with us. And then uh, we look at the lowest evaluation score. And for many of our sites, that could be every person could be in the highly effective range. And it comes down to a tenth of a point for their evaluation score. That's how it's applied. Okay. Um, so, oh. Can I just ask a follow-up question real quick? Yes. Okay, so um, because right now, right right after COVID, we're trying to help our students get get back, you know, to a good space, especially in our schools that require it. And we are, um, you know, letting go of highly effective teachers. Um, can you please provide me 
or, you know, I don't know if the other board members want it, but I would like a list of the highly effective teachers that are affected by this, <clears throat> by this budget cut, please. Okay, the question is the list of the highly effective teachers. Um, Dr. Whalen, you want to respond? So we're in the very beginning um, portion of this after we have our pools um, that are conducted on May the 13th and 14th. Those are our instructional pools. We will have a better idea of the number of carryover pool, uh, you know, carryover um, staff members. Because there, please remember, we're still going to have tremendous movement over the next three months. Uh, people are, are making all kinds of decisions that they need to. Moves typically happen as it is and so as soon as that we know that we have an available um, spot we again we have a lot of transition that will be occurring um, through that process so we will know better after we conduct our polls on the May 13th and 14th a preliminary list of any highly effective people that are in the pool we will have um, after the April 30th after the transfer period concludes yeah and that's such a great question uh, member Perez about the fact that we will have attrition. I believe Superintendent Davis would like to speak on that. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Doc, and thank you, Miss um, Gray. It, it, overall, you've seen that through the first wave of this process, when we were in end of September, of October, and we had to make some staff and adjustments, we tried to focus on eliminating current vacancies to protect personnel, and we did just that. When we cut over 500 positions, overall, we ended up with le 40 or less positions that we actually had to let go who those individuals are in temporary. Why one's too many, I agree. We have really focused to protect people. And in this process, it will be the same mentality. Why we have, um, we'll have to cut over a thousand inclusive of district personnel and school-based personnel and support. We will work to make certain that we use attrition to be able to protect as many individuals as we can. That has been a, uh, a first priority during the first wave. It is still a priority as of right now. Now we're working through human resources. We're working with uh, you know CTA to make certain that we can find and leverage uh, teacher credentials, support staff certifications to be able to put them in jobs. The biggest thing that you will see uh, why we make these corrections, which we have to be able to do, is that the disruption will be that individuals will have to move from one facility to potentially another facility. Um, and we agree. While teachers, support staff, and leaders have have really done a really nice job building relationships at their particular school. Overall, it's just about taking and implementing the staff allocation plan that hasn't been implemented for years. So making certain that, you know, and we know there's an anxious moving one school to the next, but they get a chance to be able to create thriving relationships the same way that we heard in October about being able, you know, as we move 300 individuals, they'll tell you that they built new relationships, they built, they, they have connected with their communities and they're thriving to make that connectivity overall. Thank you, and thank you, Member Perez. Uh, member Hahn, who's our next um, question person? Mem member Vaughn and uh, then Member Snively. Okay, uh, Member Vaughn, you are recognized. Thank you very much, and I appreciate you giving us an opportunity to talk about there, this. There is so much anxiety and fear and frustration from the community. Um, I know that I'm sure other board members are overwhelmed. Um, you know, and I, I do want to say thank you to our community for um, passionately advocating for public education, um, for rallying against these these changes because they know how devastating they're going to be to our schools um, and and rest assured that you have board members who are who are who are with you and, and staff members um, I think the biggest frustration that I'm hearing is the timing of this um, is that people are understanding that you know we are not getting enough revenue and that we don't have um, enough money to pay our operational fees and that you know the concern is can we can we pay our employees but a lot of feedback that I get is we have so much money coming. As far as we've referenced CARES Act 2, in the information that we've gotten, there hasn't even been a reference to CARES Act 3, which is much larger and uh, we're anticipating to get it sooner. And while I talk to my constituents who say, I understand that that can't be a long-term fixed, 
to do this now in the middle of all of these changes when there's less revenue than there ever has and we don't really have an idea of where students are going to go and what this is going to look like, if we can use that money to supplement another year before we really look at this and we have a, a better idea of attrition and what the legislation is going to do and other money that we're going to have that, you know, they're frustrated that with kind of, even though it's not a long-term fix since we do have some money that could tie us over to, to kind of get an idea of what it's going to look like within the next year, why we're not being more aggressive about that since it will directly relate to student achievement in our schools. Um, so I'd like to ask about that and then I think in that we have to talk about what our shortfall is each month and what it looks like and how much money it would cost us even for a year to kind of how much we'd have to utilize. Um, and then I, I just have two more questions. One would be about class size and an update on furloughed days. So I don't know how you right. want to how you want to address yeah, that. I, I can address all of them. First and foremost, through the chair, thank you. Okay. Yep. Superintendent Davis, you're recognized. Thank you, ma'am. So first and foremost, you know, CARES Act 2 money, we continue to be on the sidelines related to a timeline that we are going to receive this. We The application was closed on April the 12th through the Department of Education. So our hopes is that this money will be able to transition to our school district very soon. What that money is going to allow us to do is openly meet the 3% threshold and continue to make sure we meet payroll for all of our employees throughout the, the end of the year. So we do not have additional funding related. If we do, it's very small, as we've outlined uh, to the board a couple times, related to what that funding may look like and how we will expend it. Now, when uh, on in March, I think it's March 23rd, 2021, there was a, a release to Department of Education received CARES Act three funding, and, and we in every school district uh, or every state, the start of every state has 60 days to be able to extend that to. Uh, the agencies that it can be awarded. That means that we should get this money by May the 23rd, 2021, if, if you know, hopefully that everyone follows the expectations of the 60 days. We get two-thirds of that uh, funding up front, which means that it will be somewhere in the, around 260 plus million dollars. It's been uh, very clear about how we use the, these monies in the same manner that CARES 1 and 2 could be potentially used all for COVID and to be able to further um, protect the experiences for, for, for children. The issue becomes if, you know, if we use and leverage CARES 3 money, because CARES, CARES 2 has gone for 3%, CARES 3 money for personnel, openly you come back in the same scenario that we find ourselves in where soft money has been used for uh, personnel and once that ends, it then becomes there, you know, either you separate create the separation or you try to find hard money um, you know openly the way the trends that the money has been extended to school uh, to school districts from the Department of Education historically we don't forecast that if we use the soft money to protect people now that in one year or two years as that money is potentially exhausted that we would have sufficient funds to continue to have that carryover uh, and open in, in openly I don't want to be one of the leaders that kicks this can down the road and I'm not saying that in a disrespectful manner because I agree with Mrs. Hahn related to the sacrifices that we're having to make from an educational perspective. And as a superintendent, I would never make these decisions if our back were not against the wall. Um, so... You know, I think there's as this money comes, there's an opportunity to have some creative solutions and conversations about what we could do and leverage that money because 260 plus million dollars is a lot of funding. And uh, but how um, we would use it to to further expand initiatives and provide interventions for our students, especially for those who are experienced two or three or more uh, years of learning loss within our within our communities. So could you tell me how much monthly Sorry. our shortfall is when it comes to? to paying our salaries. So, Ms. Johnson, I don't know if you have that on hand. No, I don't have those numbers on hand. Sorry. I don't have those numbers on hand. I want to have the opportunity to review the budget in detail before I speak regarding yes, the budget because I have a way of analyzing the budget so we can right. see where our shortfalls are coming in. And I, as I talked to each of the board members, I said I'm going to be resetting and projecting out so you guys can follow along and understand where we are when it comes to budgeting instead of looking at monthly reports. We're going to be projecting forward so you can understand where we are presently and where we're heading in the 
impact of when we have these one-time resources, how it impacts the budget, that you cannot put staffing and be building a budget on, you never put personnel service in one-time resources because that money is gonna go away. We have to relive within our means and that's what's living with our current and resources that is available. And when you do that and you start building on resources that are one time, you have you have the situation where you have to let people go and that's we don't want to be back in that state. So I'm gonna build the budget and when I get a personal and I'm, I'm sure of everything in the budget. I'm going to present those reports out to the board, and we're going to have a detailed workshop, and we're going to go through the, um, the budget in detail. And actually, that very question, uh, Member Vaughn, has been already brought to Roe uh, Johnson. Your uh, abbreviated first name is Roe, correct? Right. That's correct. And, and with utmost respect and welcome. Uh, but that question also she has in her litany of, uh, of a new way of work, so to speak. Um, and. I think maybe because she hasn't been formally introduced, uh, yeah. Superintendent, we need to introduce uh, Miss, Miss, or is it Doctor? Oh my goodness! No, it's yes. not Doctor. It's, it's <laughs> okay. So, uh, through the chair, I would say we've had a you know a, a great week uh, already of, of transition in uh, more than a week. We've been on the 29th, the two weeks that Miss mm -hmm. Johnson has been here. She's throwing herself uh, right into the job. And one thing I got to say, you know, her just her presence, her confidence about her role and her, and her ability and her dyna it makes her truly dynamic so we're excited about her rolling up her sleeves and being able to get into this job and and not everyone would be willing to take on this type of difficult situation knowing where we are financially and um, due to her history and ability to go into school districts whether it's San Diego whether it's uh, Columbia whether it's Detroit and who've all faced some financial deficits and helped them turn the ship around we're, we're Great, grateful to have her, and excited about her leadership. And we'll get the the overall expenditure revenue deficit. We know that we are, you know, revenue our expenditures are 130 plus million dollars, and we generate around 99 million dollars. But we'll get the overall monthly aspects so we can provide. Ms. Johnson, anything you want to introduce yourself or say? No, I'm glad to be here, and I'm hoping that we can turn this ship around. For our school district and the kids. Well, That's right. She says she, we plan to turn the school district <laughs> That's together. An That's, right. That's yeah. an effort. Well, you'll That's get right. it all in a great tagline real soon. Uh, <laughs> and uh, well, we want to welcome you and uh, our talks with you as individual uh, board members have been very fruitful. So thank you right. for uh, for everything that you're doing for our district, yes, uh, Superintendent Davis. Yes, ma'am. I wanted. I think there's one more question related to furloughs. The, oh, there were there sorry. are two more questions. There's I a think, lot in there. Thank so I'm you. To welcome. Oh, okay. Welcome. We have to our district. Okay. So furlough, let's, 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 I'll do furlough last. What's the first one? Uh, um, people are confused about class size and whether okay, there's an amendment and talking yeah. to um, schools and how that sure. works and whether we've extended based to meet the, the state needs what our class size are going to sure. look like and how that affects the cuts. Furlough date. And also, can you explain if the board votes on these cuts? Okay. Yes, through the chair, the, the first the first question is related to class size. We're statutorily required to follow class size in, in, in our core classrooms as mandated. We will always do that. This is the reason the Department of Education provides us the categoricals for class size assistance. We monitor that openly through Mrs. Bays and uh, Ms. McRae and our regional superintendents on sometimes in, in, the period, in the window it gets to be like a daily basis. Yes. So and, um, in, in CTA worked with us as well when they hear particular issues and we come to the table to try to address. A lot of that is just about maximizing sections within a master schedule because one class may have, let's just say the, the expectation is to have 25 in a high school, one class may have 27 yeah. and the other one may have 22. So being able to refine the schedule to make certain we hit the class size so there's, there is a very, you know, a, an equitable way to, to serve children in a, under the overall guidance and we look at it from class size is looked at from a, as a school, a school district of choice. It is from K to uh, K to three. It's four through eight, and then you have nine through twelve. So K to three is eighteen on an average. Uh, when you look at four through eight, it's twenty-two on an average. And you look at high school, it's nine uh, grades nine through twelve is twenty-five to an average. As you look at uh, elective classes, elective cl classes, as you know, are, are going to be expanded. They historically always are. Whether a PE coach, sometimes, and we talk about you know physical education. 
position in a high school could have 50 kids. Um, when you look at course, you could have a whole ensemble that you're working with. Um, but overall, if we have something that's a computer tech class, if we have a keyboarding class, if we have a, a culinary class, we will always make certain that those classes serve uh, the number of students that they have the resources for. So indirectly, if you have a digital design class and they have 30 computers uh, for students to be able to interact with, we will make certain that, that we you know protect the have 30 students going to that class. You don't have two other students that are on the outside trying to push in. So we will always meet class size. And as it relates to uh, furlough days. Oh, I would like to say I think it's important that we mention on average. So that doesn't mean every yes, classroom has to meet that. That means that correct. out of the school on that, average that so that, that parents understand that. Yes, Thank you. I'm so, sorry. Go no, ahead. So Mrs. Vaughn is, is correct. It could be 17. It could be 17, 17, 19 if you have three classrooms. So overall we'll try to be, you know, we're with, a, with school district of choice, we'll meet that average in order to stay compliance. Um, Thank you. We'll monitor it. As it relates to uh, these initiatives, it's my role to establish the budget and make certain that we, uh, you know, implement all of the the necessary adjustments in staff and allocation, not only at the district level but at the school level. This information doesn't have to be board approved um, historically in, in Hillsborough County. So um, my job is to make certain I educate every board member along the way, which we have done, to talk about um, where these potential adjustments will be made, uh, what programs we will continue to protect, and we and we will continue to work through. The this process. Once again, principals will have an opportunity to meet from now until the summer, continue to develop their master schedule, and as we have uh, master schedule reviews in the summer, which will be in July, we will determine whether or not we need to uh, to add particular uh, classrooms based on class size, add for school improvement, based on uh, any data that we get from the Department of Education, at the same token, be able to further add for programmatic uh, within, within our schools. So that will continue to take place. And the last one is furloughs. So one of the strategies that we implemented and discussed in, on January the 12th was talking about district furloughs. And holistically we saw that it was going to be $3.5 million for every 12 month employee. But after looking at different strategies and revenues for the overall budget, we decided that anyone that's in, the, in an administrative role will, whether that's um, assistant principals, principals, supervisors, directors, regional soups, cabinet members, and myself, that we will Will be the ones that we will address from a furloughs perspective. We're still looking at the overall implementation of it. I can guarantee that the executive team members and myself will that furlough will happen immediately for June, and uh, we're looking at creative solutions for all the other individuals as we transition to potentially um, a different solution for uh, over time to be able to um, to capture that. Uh, executive team and myself will take more days than anyone else in the district. And openly, one may say that it's it's not enough, but you know, openly, when do we ever get to a point where it's enough? Uh, so you know, our, our job is to uh, to try to, to generate as much revenue that we can. We know that we want to protect all of our assistant principals and principals because they work so very hard during a pandemic. But we're just trying to be able to. We need it as a strategy to recoup funding along the way. Thank you, Superintendent I think Davis. I all of them. Thank, yeah, you, uh, yes. thank you. Thank uh, you, <laughs> Member Vaughn. Um, and uh, it's it's a big learning curve. And one of, one of the things that we're all going to take away from this, it's fluid. It's changing it all the time. But at any rate, let's go ahead. Uh, our finance guru here, I believe it's Member uh, Member Han, who's next on the oh, agenda. Uh, Member Snively. Member Snively, you are recognized. Thank you, um, and it's nice to meet you in person. Ms. Johnson, welcome to the school district. Uh, just as a side note, I appreciate the fact that you are going to provide us with some projections in the future and not just flag reports, because that's exactly what they are. We need to see some, some uh, lead reports so that we can take lead measures which are able to help get our district right size. So um, obviously this is a really you know difficult um, situation to be to be in uh, financially. We've been in similar situations in the past. It's not exactly new. Um, some of these conversations are, are familiar conversations, but the fact that we have uh, not used or um, been aligned with these allocation models in the past, uh, that's the difference in this particular conversation is that there are, res uh, there are instructional resource allocation models um, that we should have been using. In 
in the in the past, and now we are uh, being more strict about uh, aligning our human resources with those allocation models. So, um, the question I had, uh, and you kind of addressed it a little bit um, earlier, but you know, there the 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 um, issue with the enrichment programs, music, art, physical education. Um, I, it's hard sometimes for parents to let go of some of those things, and or they or the miss. I think there's some miss. Um, perception about taking away those programs versus adjusting those programs. And so you had used an example previously about um, um, the, the student um, interest or student enrollment in certain programs and how they may have gone at one point um, and then a full program to now the students are, there's not enough students to support it. Can you talk a little bit more about that so that parents can understand why maybe the music, one music, one full music teacher or one and a half music teachers is going to one or a half of a music teacher? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Do the chief. I apologize. Um, Superintendent Davis, you're recognized. Yes, ma'am, through the chair. So the biggest thing is, is you know, I'll give you an example. So Blake High School has journal, journalism and creative writing, and that has been a pathway, one of the offerings that, that they have. And, and my understanding through speaking through our regional superintendents and our, and our chief is that there may have been, you know, 50 people that transitioned to aspire to take the, those particular pathways. However, when you do for this school year, as you transition to next year, we're seeing that we only have 14 students that have selected that as a point of interest and that's because you have a, you know students that are graduating out of the school so being able to consolidate and adjust the overall schedule is a necessity because other courses of interest maybe theater expansion maybe uh, you know the literacy of art maybe uh, points of interest of our school and they take those initiatives and they try to grow new thriving programs uh, holistically within the school so you'll start to see that and when you look at the current allocations, you know, some of our schools, <clears throat> why we want to be able to expand, and let me just give you an example of an orchestra. I think it's beautiful. Our kids need to be involved in performing uh, in performing arts and also visual arts. But when you have nine students that uh, at a particular school that um, that are being served in, in one particular class, it's very hard to justify when other course loads may be 25 students, 30 students. And I no doubt that we should offer that section to, for those nine students and are somewhat, you know, but we may not be able to concentrationally have that one particular teacher stay because of the interest may not be there. And as you look at elementary, we are, we're only implementing the following through with the allocation plan that when I came in, I absorbed as a, as a superintendent because we didn't want to make the adjustments, but we have to implement it. So, you know, days are generated based on students that they serve. And um, so schools may go from four days of arts to three days of art. Uh, or some may go from three days to four days. It's all contingent on the overall enrollment. So none of the initiatives or programs will be eliminated. It's just that sections may uh, sections and days on campuses may be uh, reduced in order to stay in the allocation model. Ms. Bays, anything? Or Ms. Jett McRae? Yes, simply just to add that the elementaries are based upon the number of homerooms. And again, that's nothing that we have changed this year. It's just based upon the number of homeroom teachers that we have. But one follow-up question, if that's okay. Uh, then, Absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, then is there something that we can do as a school district to help support teachers who to uh, recruit more students, yeah. right? So maybe uh, a school used to be known for their chorus. Sure. And there were yeah. 180 kids that were signed up for chorus, and now only you know, 17 kids sure. want to sign up for chorus. So how can, what can, can we give teachers? teachers tools or resources to for outreach so that maybe they can recruit more students because obviously if there's a need for it then that substantiates the teacher if there's enrollment for it that substantiates sure. the teacher when enrollment you know, goes down year after year after year, it's really difficult to substantiate a teacher for that particular class, whether it's music or art or, or whatever. But um, what, is there something that we could do as a district to give the teachers the tools for recruiting for those types of classes so the need's there? Yes, ma'am, through the chair. We, we definitely can help uh, internally with, with our teachers to talk about how we 
have short-term and long-term goals for a particular expansion. You know, when we look at what we offer for NJROTC, you know, one thing is Hillsborough County is a model for the number of students enrolled in that program. And that's because we do a really nice job marketing what it brings for camaraderie, team, discipline, approach, and the success rates they have outside of um, uh, ROTC as they, tra as they transition out. Uh, we got to do the same things internally, whether it's art, music, PE, uh, you know, photography, journalism, creative writing, uh, whether it be uh, you know, aeronautics, uh, culinary, we've got to be there for them and we've got to uh, help display. I think the pandemic has really handcuffed our students to be able to, dis to display their overall uh, opportunities of what they've uh, learned in their classrooms. And so we've got to be, we, we can help them through that process. I can get with communications, get with my uh, stack committee and, and think about proactive solutions to be able to do that. I think you're right. I think the pandemic, because those are all hands-on activities, yeah. and the pandemic has really hampered mm -hmm. some of the ability to reach out and get students interested in those. So I look forward to yeah. seeing what we can do to help teachers get back on track for recruiting students. Thanks. Thank you. And I think it's also, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. I know I'm, I'm probably taking everybody's time today. Uh, I well, apologize. You, you are the superintendent. I know, so. but I, I, and I got so much I want to say. <laughs> I think we have to do a better job. Like I'm, I'm get a chance to meet with some of our band leaders at Plant City High School and some others. I don't know if it's this week or next week, but you know they're trying to figure out how we have thriving programs at high school. We just can't go to high school and think we're going to have a really solid pro band program or an orchestra. It's really truly got to be committed to a K-12 side of the work and having positions to be able to put in middle schools. And you know as we get through this correction, you'll see the same thing that I did in Duval and Clay. We put art, music, PE, and media in every one of our elementaries and try to grow that program to have them banned at middle schools, and we're committed to do that once we get on solid footing financially. I think that's going to be able to start that initiative as well, and not just say, hey, you know what, we have culinary arts in, in high school, but what can we be able to trickle down in middle school and elementary for exposure as students start to find a love and pathway they want to be exposed to? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. No, I mean, uh, point well said said, uh, Member Snively, the identity of the school is what uh, Member Snively is saying, that we have to ensure that they have their identity, and, and that's such a, a very important point. So we're going to go ahead. Uh, Member Hahn, who's our next speaker? Member Combs. Member Combs, you are recognized. Um, thank you so much. Um Chair Gray. I, I think Member Vaughn and um, Member Snively um, made many of the comments but I, I made but uh, that I wanted to make. But one of my questions was, as some of these programs are eliminated, what does the pathway look like for the return of the programs? And I think one of the most difficult parts of losing some of our programs is I feel that maybe some of our schools didn't feel like they had enough time to market that program or market that's, you know, if they had one orchestra, I think maybe, you know, they didn't have enough time. So what does that look like for returning that program uh, for the future or anything like that. So, And then I have another comment or question no, after that. That's a great question. Yeah. The return of the program. Yes, Thanks, Member Hahn. I mean, Member Combs. Superintendent Davis, go ahead. Yes, Member the Chair. I don't believe we're losing a significant number of programs in our school district. Those programs are staying intact. What you're losing is overall number of sections. So you will lose sections. There could be one-off programs where the interest may not be there. And I think you have to fold it into a another election to be able to, to help with that process. And, and when we talk about if there's a one-year program, which I think the majority of the initiatives have been historical, and this is about teachers connecting with communities, connecting with students, and, and being able to tell and show and demonstrate what the overall product and the learning process is, what uh, they're going to, to be able to be successful. It's no different than if I'm a high school baseball uh, coach and we go 5 and 20 openly parents are going to be looking for a different uh, opportunity for their child to compete in. So, you know, how do we turn that program around? How do we initiate it? And I think it's going to be about overall concentration of looking at feeder patterns and because we have so many pathways in our schools. I'll give you an example. I think Blake has maybe 30 pathways, you know, so many offerings that they have. So it's being able to, to spring that down to middle school and to elementary for greater exposure. And not only just exposure about we offer this program, but being able to 
to offer it in some type of elective that shows a true pathway of heart. And then you're able to validate it. And then being able to look at other, leverage other particular ways of generate revenue to bring different revenues to our district, whether that's grant revenue, local revenues, in order to support these initiatives and pathways. Yeah, so maybe if there is a school or something specific that we think maybe the program is going to be uh, is going to disappear, then we can speak to Ms. Bays or, or to you about that. Okay, my other comment or question, and it's a big concern for me, is um, the assistant principals yeah, who are agree. being cut, and I've I, and I'm waiting yeah. for you know I've, I talked to Mr. Porter, Porter about the legality of it as well as CTA. I think that people are forgetting that you know um, we recognize amazing teachers that put a lot of extra work in, and that's how we recognize them as being future leaders. And so we are recruiting them to become assistant principals. And to me, that seems like that group of people, that there is no place for those people to land. Mm -hmm. And I'm not understanding why we can't at least offer them a teaching position. Um, you know, if you are, you know, have 28 years into the system and you've spent 18, 20 years teaching, I mean, I don't understand. I, I want to see that if it's the CARES Act or whatever it is, I want to make sure that those 30 or 40 people are protected in our district. And I, I feel very, very um, passionate about that. Yeah, and that's, um, you know, that is the big burning question among principals, NAPs, uh, and uh, Superintendent Davis, would you yes, please address that? Thank you. Yes, Thank you, Chair. Combs. I do not disagree with Ms. Combs at all. I, I would love to be able, you know, as a former assistant principal, principal, I'd love to be able to, to guarantee the these individuals a, a job within our within our organization because they've given so much time, efforts, and energy. Especially, they worked so hard this year, like all of us have, even board members. Um, but it relates to where I'm contractually, and, and I, don't, I don't mean to put Mr. Creed on the spot, but um, he would agree contractually that our first obligation, and through our legal, is that we have to follow the contract and open up any transfer pool for teachers first. They have the greatest priority. After that pool is identified and exhausted, then we, in, in CTA would agree, then we could transition to uh, administrators and having them an opportunity to be placed within within the organization. Right now, I believe it's around 47 assistant principals that fall into the, this category. Um, when we start, and, and every day that number's moving because as individuals retire and as individuals leave and find others, I mean, this week we had two that transitioned out of county uh, that we're filling those positions. So that 47 becomes 45. And I will tell you, we have close to 15 uh, principals that are going to retire this year. And we're not going, and why I want principals to be able to hire their assistant principals, because I believe if I'm going to hold principals accountable, they should be able to select the individuals in which they need uh, their school. And, and we should, I shouldn't tell them what their needs are. They should know and be able to find that particular skill set. So this year, after we address um, a, a look at attrition, being able to place new principals for those who retire and other adjustments, I think that number is going to be really, really small and we're going to be able to potentially take care of all those individuals. Well, I, I would just like to see if we could even use the CARES 3 or something that we can do if for those people. I would like to be really creative and think about those people and if it's, if it's 20 people or if it's 2 people, I think those people, you know, they didn't have a choice if they had to come back to school or not. They, they had to come back to school. Yeah. Member Combs, had to I, I have an idea, time. just yep. because I know what you're thinking, yes. uh, of course, yeah. <laughs> not that I have ESP, but uh, Rob, can you make a statement or two? This is a dilemma, as you can see. Yeah. We, we are pushing against the union for, because we know that might be the solution, but it's not, and we're pushing against yeah. the reality. Member Combs, would it's that be okay contract. with you? If, yeah, if I mean, Mr. I just Preach would like to come up with some some, some, some solutions. Possibility, perhaps. And, and also, Mr. Porter, I had him look into the legality of that and, and how we can protect these people as well. Okay, so let's uh, let's listen to um, Mr. Crete uh, real briefly. Thanks, Rob, for just I think I'm on here, spot. Yeah. <clears throat> right? Mm -hmm. So, um, Mr. Davis is correct. <clears throat> According to our contract, teachers are prioritized with the pool. And then there would be a secondary pool for our administrators for those that want to have continued employment. What I would ask this board to look at is with the number of employees that we're looking at 
cutting, so to speak, we should have a pathway for continued employment for all of these employees. The teachers that would be in carryover pools, the administrators that are no longer with a position, but we believe that we need all of these adults in our district and in our schools, so there should be a pathway for this continued employment for the system principals as well as all of these educators across the district. So by contract, we're doing it and we're holding the district to the contract as we are expected to do and we should do, but we believe that we could come up with some creative ways to uh, have continued employment for all of these employees. And that might mean um, looking at teaching things that they might never have taught before or, or doing some of the duties in our district that they might not be certified for by getting an intent to earn or doing something else to help meet the needs of our students. And Sure. Sorry. I think Superintendent Davis would like to remark yes, upon your remarks, and, and then we'll go to the next yes, uh, uh, board member. Go ahead. I agree everything with what Mr. Creech said, and we, we're going to work and try to create that as an avenue for um, for those who may not be certified in one particular area and those who have the aspiration for the intent they earn. Any of the administrators that are transitioning back to the classroom, um, which I believe it, it is going to be a small amount, we're going to create a cohort in our leadership pipeline, and those individuals individuals that why they will be in if they have to take on classroom positions or not in the AP role we will help them along the way with monthly meetings to stay relevant related to instructional works instructional concentrations what our areas of focus are what's our strategic planning process so they can stay apprised of the overall uh, you know direction of the school district and we will do everything we can so we're not going to allow principals while we will have somewhat of an eligibility list we're not going to allow principals to go outside of those individuals uh, when they look to hire this summer. We're going to exhaust that particular list to be able to show uh, concentration and value for those who are, are, are in that role. Okay, so thank you, Mr. Crete. We, thank you, Madam we did, Chair. You know, with respect to this, you know, huge amount of uh, frustration, I wanted to perhaps get this a little bit into deeper. Uh, you know what? Uh, I probably am overdoing the time on the unit, but that's okay because it looks like these are burning questions. Uh, and board members, um, we only have about 10 minutes to 12. Uh, Member Han, how much time do we have till till 12 noon? Yeah, 11 minutes. 11 minutes. And we have just, um, unless somebody wants to get back in the queue, we have myself, Member Washington, and you. Okay, Member Han, you're next. Yes. Um, so, um, Superintendent Davis, d do school districts or schools in general make these types of staffing decisions typically this time of year? And if so, how is this different? than in the past, is it a larger number? Is it, you know, because I know every year typically districts right. make staffing decisions based on, you know, FT. Yes, ma'am, to the chair. This is the, historically, this is the time that you would make adjustments for the next year. You're planning the phase. You would get through the, the, the February FTE. You would look, you would calculate historical trends and look at October, February and start making those adjustments. I will tell you that Hillsboro has made staffing adjustments as early as November for the following year. And that's where you get in trouble because you, you can't say November because you don't know what the legislator is going to come out from a financial perspective. All that should be in, in concert. So this is the time of year that you would do it in order to prepare for the year coming. Thank you. And um, the question I've been getting, and, and I, I thank the other board members for the questions they've asked. I think we're all getting the same emails, so it's helping yes. in that regard. Right. So um, just to clarify, so some of my, obviously these decisions are being made based on the October, February FTE. And and since then, they've had more students come back. Sure. If they start the new year on the October FTE, can they earn back some of these units that are lost? Absolutely, through the chair, we, we will have July, we will start seeing students enroll, so that's why we have a July master schedule review, and then once again, we will sit with every regional superintendent and chief within the first 20 days, 20 day count, and also CTA to look at class size, okay. and they could generate that ba uh, based on overall enrollment. We looked at uh, enrollment trends for the last three years, so 
So one thing we don't want to get into is releasing individuals and then have to rehire. We know that that's going to happen. We just don't want to happen at major scale. And we want to be in concert with what we've historically done. But we might see that it might happen on a bigger scale due to that's, COVID. That's correct. so many kids were home. Yes, ma'am. Because that's the question I'm getting is, you know, we lost so many kids during COVID. What happens when they all come back in the fall and now we've lost these teachers? Yes, so ma'am. There will be adjustments Absolutely. for that. I, I appreciate that. And then... Um quickly around the pool I have a question because this came up with some of my constituents who are teachers that um, were uh, put in the pool during the first round of cuts in the fall and still haven't found a place okay. um, do they get and could it be considered that they get seniority with the current pool because they're being told no they don't have seniority and over the new people that are getting cut does that make sense does that yeah. make sense so they would like to know, and if not, Go can ahead, it be considered that they get priority when the new pool opens? Yes, they will, based on seniority. And we were just meeting last week um, with CTA about where we still have the carryover pools in those particular areas. So I'm not so, saying seniority. I'm saying, will they get priority? Because maybe they're not senior to somebody who's getting cut this week when they got cut in the fall. But will they get priority? That's why they're it, still for where the vacancies occur. Yes, okay. they will be a part of the pool process. Okay. Um, can I just speak to the numbers really quick to yes. your earlier question, Dr. Hahn? Yes. So last year, so the time frame is the, the same time frame. You are correct. Last year we had a, um, about 450 teachers identified to go into the pool. Mm -hmm. It is a greater number at this current time as of Friday and I'm always reluctant to put those numbers out there because it's moving target. Mm -hmm. But we had 750 52 teachers. So just to give a little context, it's about 300 more that we have identified. Okay. Okay, would, so would I want to give that number. They, those 300 could end up, like Mr. Crete said, he had some good points that they could now apply for another position and do a willingness to earn. Yes, ma'am. And, so and vacancies continue to open you know, each day. We have about 490 vacancies that we've already identified for next year. Okay. So I'm looking at about an under, another 262 at this current time as of Friday. That's a very good question. I'm just staring at uh, Shay McRae mm -hmm. because the high <laughs> needs schools, yeah. I know that Member Washington probably want to ask a question about that. Uh, Member Hahn, are you all finished? I am. And, you know, we do have just one more point. We have a lot of critical shortage areas, you know, that um, middle school science, math, high school science, math, special ed, those are, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all areas oh, yes, that we too. could have teachers go into and do some willingness to earn. Okay, thank you. Those no, that's, all my a, that's a great question. The pool has always been the mysterious uh, pile of great uh, people in the pool who's yeah. going to be first chosen. Yeah. Thanks, um, member Dr. Hahn. Mm -hmm. See, I have all kinds of titles for you. Okay, well, I'm, I'm getting I'll all, answer all of them. I, I, I'm getting, <laughs> getting everything together. Um, who's our... Uh, uh, we have member Washington, member and Washington. then uh, Chairwoman Gray, okay. and then if anyone else wants to circle back in, uh, and member... Uh, Snively wants to circle back in. Okay. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Washington. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, this is part of the year that I always hated as being a principal. And we, all the principals know that because you have to cut personnel, and it's very difficult because you hire the person, and 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 you want to hire the very best person for the job. And once you get them in the job, uh, sometimes we don't have enough units to keep them. You know, and uh, it's very difficult. I mean, it's been really taxing on me. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, because I have quite a few people that I know, I know in, the, in the district, but you know, we have to do what we have to do, and it's difficult to make those decisions. Uh, one of my questions I had, and uh, what are we doing about the transformation schools? Because that's important to have the right people in those schools, mm -hmm. and those are low performing schools. So, mm -hmm. can you mm -hmm. elaborate on that for me? Yes, Shay McCray, you're yeah. on. 
So the first thing I'd like to note is back in September when we had our original cuts, uh, Mr. Davis protected transformation schools. So we did not endure any of those cuts and we were able to sustain our positions. Across all of our 28 schools, we might be down to less than maybe 20 vacancies as we sit right now. That's never been that low. We've always had high vacancies, but we have really been able to not only hire but retain really good teachers. We also have a process with HR that when we are seeking um, new teachers and we hire new teachers, we're looking for effective and highly effective teachers. We want to get the best people in the building. Um, and so that has worked out um, well with us in our, our partnership with HR. So this upcoming year, because we were able to sustain teachers in September, we really are going into the new year with very few vacancies. We may have some adding, um, added positions because kids are coming back, um, but we have very few vacancies that will be open. And so we will be monitoring that. And I'm not concerned at this time at all with vacancies going into uh, the next year. We've been really good about staying on top of that. Great, great. That's good to hear because those transformation schools really need help and we try to recruit the best teachers yes. coming to those positions. Uh, uh, one more question. Um, uh, Superintendent, will you, I, I would like for you to clarify because when, when you are talking about cutting positions, a lot of times people hear the word position and they think you say a thousand positions. Oh, you cutting a thousand people. Could you go into a little detail that for the constituent, my constituents? Yes, sir. Sorry. Yes, sir, to the chair. So, Thanks. you know, no different than we did in, as I said earlier in, in the fall, we cut positions, but we, we protected so many people other than 40. As we transition to this year, you know, while we're cutting over a thousand positions, you'll see the majority of people impacted, I would say, at percentages at the district at the district level, those who are outside of the schools, um, because we have people in those positions. But overall, we will see that through the right to earn and being able to look at the adjustments for um, at our school district, there's a, a I don't want to give a number unless Marie wants to give me a number. She's like, no, they're still working on the process this week. <laughs> but we're going to do everything we can to protect people, and uh, it's been very clear that just because we're saying we're, we're cutting a thousand positions, it doesn't mean we're letting go a thousand people. Right. It could be ten people. It could be a hundred. I mean, it's it's just all based on credentials mm -hmm. and based on need through attrition. So we're going to work through that process. I, I do love the fact that there's an opportunity to earn there. I think that's a, a smart strategy for those who have aspirations to do so. And we're going to try to match up, you know, individuals with schools that uh, do they feel comfortable to transition to. <clears throat> even though it may be difficult, um, but it can be done. You know, 44 years I lived in Northeast Florida, and I transitioned, you know, in 13 months. I know transition's hard, but uh, I've learned, I've grown, and I'm a better educator for it. So they'll do the same. Good, good. I, I think I have one more thing I wanted to say, too. You know, I think it was a good decision because you can't win. You know, we, we all are always against our walls, against the butt, uh, our backs against the wall, excuse me. Uh, at this point, you know, I like what we're doing much better than I like what, what they did down in Miami area, where they made cuts from the district office down at the lower levels. So they made decisions for principals in their schools, and, and I don't think that should ever be made because that principal, he or she knows their school better than anybody else. So I, I really I really like doing that, having the principal to make those decisions because they know their school. So mm -hmm. um, I think we just got to keep pushing. Yes, sir. And uh, boy, this is perfect timing. Uh, Member Hahn, is it my turn to uh, Yes, ma'am. It's your turn. And, and we're just about at the end of to 12, but boy, you hit it right on the head. Superintendent Davis, the, the biggest uh, issue that I, I can see, and, and I know you and I talked about this time and time again, it, uh, the principal have to be part of the collaboration sure. at all times. I mean, I, I made a list, everything from the master schedules, the AP versus safety issues, arts, as uh, M Melissa Snively, Member Snively said, you know, how much music or should I have orchestra? You know, this is a principle-based decision. Furloughs, how will the uh, financial budgetary effects of 32 hours affect principles within two years? <laughs> I mean, APs, you know, again, when the principals are involved, they, they, they have a better feeling and uh, can narrate more uh, accurately. So uh, my, my whole um, uh, emphasis would be uh, let's please do the, the better job that we can to include the principals 
in these conversations. They work their heinies off, um, and uh, you know they're there. Most of the ones that I know, uh, and and Shake, you're one of them. Don't work for necessarily money. They're there for they love what they do. Sure. They solidly do. And I know every board member, the new ones, inclusive uh, member Vaughn, uh, all of you have met principals that are there because sure. of the love of children and what they're doing to change the educational trajectory of each child. That's what I would ask. Uh, we can always do a better job. Sure. When we wake up in the morning, we want to say, "What did I do a little bit better?" So that's 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 where I'm going to cheer later. I um, I understand the arts uh, and, and uh, the, the cuts and the uh, the um, career counselors. Right. That probably is the uh, question of the day. It's left to the principals, correct? Um, so go ahead. And, and there's an equity issue sure. uh, with that decision. So if you can speak on that. Yes, ma'am. To the chair. One of the things we wanted to do when we knew we were over school counselors based on the allocation that we inherited is that we wanted to try to find ways to protect, especially the college and career counselors at our high schools. We understand how important this role is to be able to help our children find pathways and to be successful. So, um, you know, so what we did of the 28 high schools, 23 of the current career and college counselors are certified as school counselors. So you have five individuals that are in those roles that are not credentialed. One is retiring and two have taken other roles uh, with maybe outside of the district um, moving forward. So we have two individuals that will not be able to transition into those school counselor roles that we created through mental health dollars because as we, as we leverage categorical dollars from the Department of Education, the requirement is, is that if you're going to be, you'll have a counselor to not only uh, drive the work for college and career readiness, but be able to address the overall emotional social needs of our students during a pandemic. So, you know, those two individuals were, were trying to help find a position with it within our school district based on what they particularly offer. Um, it won't be as a counselor, a college and career counselor, uh, because those while those positions in name have been eliminated, that work will continue through the, the, the additional allocations that we provide schools. Well, thank you for that answer. Yes, and, and board members, I'm just going to go ahead and just pause here in parentheses. We are at the 12 uh, o'clock noon, high noon. We have two more board members that would like to speak on this particular unit category. Uh, and board members, of course, this is your time. If you need to go, you need to go. Um, we understand. And um, I think, though, this was an issue uh, given um, uh, with deepest respect to Member Vaughn's uh, ask for an extra 30 minutes. I definitely think unit cuts were part of a need for us to converse in a relaxed way as best possible. We are going to have remarks tonight. Uh, and I don't know what we're up to, but I think 33 to 34. So uh, I'm glad that we're getting a lot of this out on the table now. So without further ado, uh, Member Hahn, who do we have next? Uh, we have um, Member Snively and then Member Vaughn. Member Snively? And Member Combs. Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, thank you, Madam Chair, and I apologize. Mm -hmm. I have to get to an appointment after, right, right after this, so I'm going to have to... Um, leave, but I just wanted, I know that there's um, a lot of talk about the CARES Act funding and uh, what, what we're going to in this organization either. I think it's a not a good good idea, especially since S&P just downgraded us today. Today. We got downgraded by Moody in January, we got downgraded by Fitch in February, and now S&P has downgraded us from a AAA to an A plus with a negative outlook, mainly because we have not done what we said we were going to do, which was make staff adjustments. And so we have a negative outlook, and now we are the largest school district with the lowest financial ratings from those agencies. So we need to think very carefully how we handle the CARES Act. And although I would love to be able to say, yes, we can use that to band-aid some of this and maybe postpone it or kick that can a little further down the road, we just can't. I just discourage us from considering that as an option. And Member uh, Snively, do you think we need to have more quickly than not that fiscal meeting that uh, Roe uh, was mentioning because this is new information. Um, 
I will defer that to the yeah. superintendent. Yeah. Superintendent yeah. Yeah. So to the chair, we, we knew the other two uh, credit ratings or bond rating were going to re reduce, uh, they, they did reduce our overall rating. We knew the third one would come on board. Just We just received it. I'll send that information out. And we're in the process of, of, of me and Ms. Gray working to figure out what the financial committee could look like. Oh, the finance committee. And, yeah. and finance yeah. committee could, could look like and have Ms. Johnson involved in that process for any any member that wants to engage on a monthly basis to talk about you know what's working, what's not, and what we can do differently financially. Yeah. That information is hot off the press. I don't yeah. even know. Yeah, and I, my reaction is just hot off the press. Thanks, Member Snively. Thank Did you, you want to finish anything else? No, I just think this is a really good conversation that we're having. I know we're going to continue having some more of this after um, we hear public comment this evening, but I think it's a good start, and I agree. It's a good environment to be able to um, share in a more relaxed environment, some conversation around it. Um, so I look forward to seeing my colleagues later today and continuing this conversation at our board meeting. Thank okay, you. and uh, Kristen Davis will be uh, on duty for the legislative uh, Update. updates. So we'll catch okay. up on that uh, right, request. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Member Snively. Uh, Member Vaughn? Thank you, and I'll make this very quick. First of all, I'd like to thank Member Washington for showing the emotion, and I hope that the public understands that while the board isn't voting on this, how deeply this affects all of us who care about our schools and our constituents and, and are here because we care um, passionately about public education. Um, I know I'm having a hard time sleeping, having a hard time eating, which is my favorite. But I'll digress. My question to you, Superintendent Davis, is so many parents are concerned. So many parents want to be able to advocate and they don't really understand. They come to us board members because they think that we, you know, we can go ahead and, and make some changes in, in what you've suggested. You know, I'm sure you've gotten your email. For parents who really understand now and want to save their programs and want to be able to advocate for public education, where do people who are frustrated and want to have some impact, where can they put this energy? Where can they have the biggest impact in making sure that our schools are supported, that students have access to programs, that there's a good class size ratio. Where would you advise them to put their energy in this? Yes, Mr. the Chair. The, right now, every community member should be pushing local legislators and legis the Senate and the House in Tallahassee. And being able to push and discuss the current funding model as we rank 43rd in the state of Florida, how we need additional funds to be able to create robust, vibrant pathways for our students um, you know I, I would go on uh, you know our, our Hillsborough website uh, it's not on ours we could um, put identify our, our legislation but I would push Tallahassee with, you know to be able to talk about how we need additional funding I, I will say this the, you know the, the governor's budget was really healthy and sensitive to education the issue becomes is that the governor doesn't have the ability to do it it's the house and the Senate that set the expectations for um, the financials and as I I sent to the board, you see there's variations um, of what the overall uh, intake will be. I would just say push and uh, you know from, from our perspective as we see what comes out this year I think the, in, in Identify I think that we need to have a coordinated effort you know, with a big school districts in the state of Florida to be able to further discuss the educational funding and what we actually would need and, and the funding's not there openly. I know it's an unpopular conversation. We've got to talk about what we can do from a local perspective perspective. And I want to say this last thing. Yeah. And while it's hard, hard on board members, I want this community to know, you know, it, it's hard on me as a superintendent. You know, when I came in, my I I signed up to move the the persistently low and performing schools. That is my wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. And while we haven't taken the ball off, you know, focus off the that you know, we haven't taken our focus away from that. You know, it, it no one gets joy out of making these hard decisions. And we talk about sleep at night. I don't sleep because of this process. But you know, on the same token, you know, I have to be a strong leader that navigates through this and try to protect people in this process, which I've proven to be able to do, but at the same time make certain that this school district doesn't go into receivership, where someone else comes in and makes cuts that discounts everyone at this table and goes deeper and deeper and deeper in, you know, in a unsensitive manner that can to, to, to go larger and that will cripple this district. So while it may be hard now, I promise there's a, there is a sunny days at the end of this tunnel. And I look forward to getting to it. And uh, thank you, Member Vaughn. And yes, the uh, other streams of money we will have to 
dive into that conversation sooner than later also. Uh, Member Combs, I mean, yeah, Member Combs, I don't know why I'm having a... This is more of a housekeeping yeah. issue. I know that this, this afternoon when we have our meeting, I anticipate 30 to 40 individuals coming. I think quite a few of them are going to come emotionally charged, but there are quite a few coming for the masks. So I, I would wonder if we can possibly separate the groups because I think the messaging that people want, um, we, I think we should try to separate that maybe to have the people who are coming in about the teacher cuts that are coming in and then maybe having the group of people who are coming in to speak. Uh, I think they're mainly coming in to speak against masks in our district. It would be nice if we could separate those two groups. Well, let me, let me just address the specifics. The amount of folks coming in for the mask are about four. Uh, uh, I, I thought it was. And, I thought but, it was about twenty. I heard, but yeah, I, maybe I'm well, wrong. Well, unless there's a lot coming, I have the list here. The, but the question is a very good question because uh, we were talking to Mr. Crete. Maybe we can get some of those speakers to speak under employee comments because a lot of it is employee, and then the others speak, you know, in the normal. So we're going to work on that. Um, but uh, Superintendent Davis, you look like you want to respond to that. Did you want to ask a, well, a process I think, yeah, question? Well, I think it's a, it's a very good point, and I think it, it, part of it will just be, it is a good housekeeping question. Some of it's logistics. I'm making eye contact with Tanya now to see if we could do it. The answer is yes, we can do it. The question is logistically, given the time crunch at the beginning of the meeting, whether we can actually get it done. So why don't I work with Tanya um, and try to come up with something and if we can find a way to group them we will in order to keep this sort of subjects discreet. But it's, 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 it's a more of a logistical issue than anything given the timing of when people are allowed to sign up and when the board meeting actually starts. But we'll work on it. When they sign up are they told you're number three? And so no, they don't know they're it, It's just a question them. of when closing off the time for um, signing up and then getting the list um, together. So Tanya's making faces at me. So um, we'll work on the issue. I understand. That, I understand the ask, and we'll try to figure out a way to she, get it done. She has the list. I have it somewhere. Tanya, how many people do we have on the mask? Do you know? Only one. Only one. And I had four uh, thought, but now it's only one. So a lot of it's going to be unit. That's why I wanted to kind of delve into it here and now. So we're prepared, and of course our superintendent will have to hear. So. From my understanding, I think there's going to be a large group coming this afternoon uh, regarding the masks. And then there's a question, um, Jim Porter, how many people are we allowing in the auditorium? How many are well, we... So that we're still following the, the rule that only 50 people at one time can be in the auditorium. And so if there are more than that, that number of people, they'll have to remain outside until people leave. Um, we have 45 minutes set aside for public comment, and the expectation is that's all that there is. Legally, that's more than sufficient. So I think the chair will have to make a decision about if you have X number of people, how long they'll have to speak, given that the, there's a 45-minute time um, commitment to that. And so the two issues that we'll work on logistically, three issues, number of people in the boardroom, and that's with John Newman and security. Number two, the topics that you um, reference and how we can um, group them together, and then the, the total amount of time and how much each speaker will get. Yeah, and, and uh, Member Combs, do you know of a group that's coming that maybe you can share uh, that's on maybe Facebook or something? Because the more we're I mean, I just keep I can, hearing that, that that's, especially keep, now with Pasco County, I, I keep hearing that there's a, a movement okay. that's trying to kind of organize here okay. for the district. All right, I was just curious yeah. because then I can prepare, we can all prepare. So, and I, okay. I, I hopefully I think we are able to not, um, I'll, hopefully we're allowed or allowing as much, I think in this circumstance we should allow additional time for public comments. That's just me speaking because I think people are coming in and they feel very emotional about their programs being cut or their teachers or, or the students. So I think that, you know, I can only speak for myself. I I just hope that we don't have to limit public comment. If we have to stay later today, I, I am completely support that. You know? Okay. And, uh, you know, we're, we are probably in for an emotional time, as uh, we have had this before, with teacher pay. Uh, and I have discussed with uh, Mr. Crete. So we're looking at a minute, possibly, but we have to be reminded we're going to divide public and employees, so we're going to cross that bridge probably uh, be right before the board meeting, but I'll talk to you too, uh, Member Combs. Um, any other remarks at this point in time? 
three minutes are for employees. So what Rob Creed is going to do is try to get some of the unit folks, the ones that are really upset, uh, you know, that to the employee comments. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah, we're trying to accommodate every situation uh, to the best of our ability, but uh, Member Combs just recognized too, we want a civil, civil board meeting. And uh, sometimes the longer we hear, hear voices, it can get a little bit more dramatic than you may feel comfortable with. So that's uh, here nor there, but we'll, we'll talk about that um, individually. Uh, board members, we are adjourned. Thank you so much. Uh, El programa de colaboración entre padre y escuela es muy importante para el distrito porque realmente tenemos casi 50 mil estudiantes que reportan hablar español en su, en su casa. Entonces esas familias deben de tener la oportunidad de, de estar involucrados en, en la educación de sus hijos. Pero lo que pasa es que cuando una familia habla un otro lenguaje típicamente eh, tienen... Um, un conocimiento limitado con el sistema educativo.